All righty then, uh, welcome back to the continuing public hearings of the Environment and Transportation Committee. I am, as always, your friendly chairman, Kumar Barve. I'm joined by the equally or perhaps friendlier vice chairman, Dana Stein, and our merry band of committee members. We're going to take these bills in numerical order, which means uh, first will be House Bill 143, Delegate Otto, followed by House Bill 318, Delegate Stein, House Bill 361, Delegate Henson, 371 Delegate Chi, and we will end the evening or afternoon with House Bill 387, Delegate Ruth. And with that, Delegate Otto, you have the floor for four minutes. Go for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, this is Delegate Charles Otto representing Somerset County. We have uh, House Bill 143 here today. It's the same uh, bill that passed our committee in the full house on uh, last year and that no action was taken on it in the Senate. Um, I asked for your favorable report. I think we have some people justifying uh, the legislation from the county. I know the county commissioners have submitted uh, testimony, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I thank you. Okay, first up is Trevor Santos with the National <laughs> Shooting Sports Foundation. Um, and it appears we're going back to the old uh, two minute timer, I see, so. Only temporary apologies for that. We just didn't get that up in time for the hearing. As soon as that one's ready, we'll switch over. Okay, sounds good. So uh, Trevor, you're on, you've got two minutes. Trevor? I actually don't believe Trevor has made it yet. I don't see okay. him in the waiting room either. In that case, we'll go to Jamie Wink. Uh, is Jamie with us in the house? <clears throat> How about Ashley Webster? I'm here. Ashley, you are, you need to turn something off because you're a super reverberating. Um, but yes, you have the floor for two minutes once you get rid of that echo. Okay. okay, hang on. I used to love the uh, Twilight Zone. <laughs> ben, what do we suppose she's doing wrong? Is she's that better? To the, she's, she's listening to the hearing at the same time. She's going to have to turn off the hearing. Okay. Go ahead and try it again, Ashley. Can you hear me? Yes, yes you're perfect now. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say um, I'm a hunter here in Somerset County. Um, I have a family here in Somerset County as well. We all hunt. Um, my children, my husband um, have several farms. Um, it's pretty important to me to get this passed for this Sunday hunting um, because we have children. Um, you know, my daughter is in school full time. I have a son that'll be in school next year. So our weekends are our only times to get out and hunt um, and do it as a family. Um, my daughter also plays sports. Um, and she has some other curricular activities on Saturdays as well. So that doesn't leave us a lot of time on Saturdays. If the weather's bad, you know, we can't hunt. Um, so Sundays would allow us that extra day to go out and do the things that we like to do with as a family. Um, getting her out and involved in those kind of things are pretty important. I did it as a kid growing up. Would have been nice to have that as a kid, as a Sunday hunt. You get that extra day. Um, I just feel like it's pretty important to get these kids out in, in the environment. Um, don't have to pull them out of school during the week. Most of all of the hunting is during the week. We have very, very few Sundays um, during deer season. So getting them um, approved for a turkey hunt or any other kind of migratory bird hunts um, would allow them to get out and do this um, together and as a family. So that's what I have for my portion. <laughs> Um, okay, very well then. We'll go next to Charles Laird, if he's with us. Mr. Laird. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. But maybe you can't uh, hear me. Are you there, sir? Uh, I'm. Can everybody else hear me? Yeah, yes, I, um, I can hear we you. We can all hear you, Mr. Chair. Oh. This is Charles Laird, the Vice President of Somerset County Commissioners. I want to thank you all today for your time. Um, 
my thing is we have some designated days for the whitetail deer season on Sundays. And I was just hoping maybe <clears throat> that the, the kindness out of your heart, so to speak, would be to think about turkey and small game for these other weekend hunts. Um, a lot of the 4-H and the younger generation needs that little extra time, I think, to get a field. And I'm not saying this to uh, take away from any other type of activities on weekends, but it's an option. I would like to see that option available just as we do um, with the designated days that we have for Sunday deer hunting throughout the year that the state designates. And the most important part is this is not about to deplete any type of the population of game. It's just to give the families options, younger hunters and whomever, that ability to hunt on a Sunday. And I thank you for your time for every one of you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, we, uh, we're, I'm gonna call the names of the other people who weren't here initially. Uh, Trevor Santos, are you with us? No? Uh, how about Jamie Wink? Jamie's here. He's having technical difficulties with our laptop. Can he testify under Charles's name here? We've got sure. this computer going. Okay, sure. Jamie's here. We'll go ahead and put him on now. You got two minutes, Jamie. All right. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, Jamie Wink, Wink Sporting Goods and Princess Anne. Uh, I just want to start out by saying that uh, hunters, they contribute – $371 million towards conversation efforts, conservation efforts, uh, as well as uh, helping bio state biologists maintain a healthy number for different species. Um, hunter numbers are on a decline due to the busy lives that we have these days. Um, most hunters get on average one day per week to hunt. Uh, this would potentially double their time in the field. And, uh, add to the economic impact that they have, which in Maryland is over 480 million annually, and uh, also contribute to 10,000 jobs being created or sustained through hunting. Um, it would also allow for families to have more time together during the coronavirus deal. Uh, when everything was shut down, we saw a number of hunters or a number of families that got back into hunting or hunted more because there was nothing else going on. And uh, as far as hunter recruitment, it, it meant a lot, or hunter retainment and hunter recruitment, it meant a lot to us because a lot of families that didn't have the time to do it, got back into it. And um, it could have a big impact for uh, Maryland as far as economics. You know, and, uh, and, and more jobs too. Um, especially for our county, we have a, it's a, a lot of hunters that come to this county to hunt. And if you could potentially double the days they get in the field, it would mean a lot to our local economics. Thank you. I can't hear. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you are muted. Uh, Trevor Santos is still not here. Okay, well, I'm going to go to um, I'm going to go to Jane Siegler, who was signed up in opposition, and then we will entertain questions for everyone who has testified. Jane, welcome back to the committee. You have two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Barbie and members of the committee. Um, this bill is almost identical to the Calvert bill that we talked about last week, so I will keep my comments short. We have submitted extensive written testimony with lots of data to support our arguments. This bill would allow Sunday hunting in Somerset County on all 52 Sundays of the year on private land and also on public land that is leased to a hunt club. This apparently refers to the Chesapeake Forest, a complex of over 75,000 acres, some of which is in Somerset, and the forest has over 36 miles of hiking trails. Sunday hunting is a significant deterrent to outdoor recreation by the non-hunting general public. 78% of a 2018 Gonzalez poll respondent said they would alter their recreational plans to avoid hunters. In a Maryland Horse Council 2016 poll, 85% of our respondents said they would regularly change their schedules or riding locations to avoid encountering hunters. That deterrent effect is borne out by the eight page incident report we submitted with our testimony. 
Outdoor recreation has increased exponentially since the pandemic, and many of these new users are unfamiliar with the rules of hunting and hunting seasons, including the distinctions between private and public land. The majority of Marylanders oppose Sunday hunting, 68.9% in the Gonzalez poll, and even in a DNR's own commission survey, the majority did not favor Sunday hunting, and these numbers applied in both urban and rural jurisdictions. Licensed hunters in Maryland represent 2% of the population. They have six days a week. We are asking for just one. So we ask that this bill be given an unfavorable report. Thank you. Okay, very well then. Uh, questions from the committee? Well, I don't see any questions. Uh, Delegate so, Boyce has her hand up. I'm not oh, sure if it's not popping up for you for some reason. I'm sorry, uh, it's in the color of my skin, so it blends in in the back. Oh, oh God. God. All right. I'll make All it right. Mine next time. No, it was my fault. I wasn't in the right spot to look at the hand raised. Okay. okay. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a couple of questions um, regarding, uh, just to clarify, that this is only on private land. Because there's an exception, and I, 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 the exception uh, worries me a little bit, I think, if I'm reading it correctly. No, Delegate Boys, this applies to certain uh, uh, public lands as well that are leased to hunt clubs that make a sizable investment in uh, food plots and uh, uh, fencing and protection of the property. Uh, it would allow them to utilize that, which is an important part of uh, as uh Mr. Wink referred to of people coming from other areas of the state and in uh, joining in for the week or the weekend to uh, have this extra day. Thanks, um, Delegate. So, so if I'm just uh, to clarify, so hunting clubs are on public land, but but public, I mean, excuse me, but hunting clubs tend to be on ground that they also hunt on. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so does this hunting club, for instance, currently have the, the ability to hunt on its own property without this bill? Well, the leases that they have through the state and many of those were acquired when the state purchased the property from Chesapeake Forest Products and uh, that was something that was continued out and there's generations that have uh, utilized that uh, arrangement and part of the uh, deal when uh, Governor Ehrlich purchased those properties was that uh, they would be able to, a certain portion of them would still be able to continue to operate. Okay, um, and then my, my next question is about, uh, I forget the gentleman's name who testified, I kept hearing about job creation and economics. If somebody can break that down for me a little more, I, I, I'd be interested in hearing it. Hunting is a job? I don't have the figures that they uh, announced, but it's certainly the, the sporting goods area, the hunting stores, the clothing, uh, uh, fuel, or the local restaurants. Uh, they uh, all get benefits out of uh, the hunting population. So, so I, I guess I, I, I see that. But well, I, I heard something that said job creation, which I was a little. It, it was. Can I talk? Yes, you can. You can. Yeah, it, yeah. So it, it was not just not solely on that. It was job create job that jobs that are created just for hunting, just from hunting and jobs that are sustained through hunting was over 10,000. And that was according to the Association of the Fish and Wildlife Agencies from 2020. Mr. I understand that. I, 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 was, I wanted some examples of what exactly are you talking about when you say what, what type of job? Um, uh, hunting guides, um, you know, hotel and restaurant management and, and serving jobs from the communities like ours that are deeply impacted from this. You know, Mr. Laird, if you have an article or something uh, and you want to send that to us, we can enter that into the um, you know public testimony or send it to Delegate Otto and he can do it for you. Yeah, I can, I can get that, that article and send it to you. It's, it's from the National Fishing and Wildlife 
Association. I can do that. Okay. And, and I'm sure we can gather some more numbers from DNR on the hunting license figures and how many participate in different things. Okay. Any further questions? Um, uh, Delegate Boyce, are you, uh, do you, are you good or do you have any more questions? Uh, he didn't answer my question, but I, I guess I'll wait for the information. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. So that ends the public hearing on uh, House Bill, what is it? Um, 143. Let's go to House Bill um, 318, uh, the uh, Delegate Stein, the Vice Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, this bill deals with septics. It is a reintroduction of uh, a bill we had last year, which our committee and the full House approved. It didn't get out of EHE in the Senate, but this year it is cross followed by Senator Hester, who's on EHE. Now, there are more than 400,000 homes in Maryland that have septic systems, but problems with their design, installation, and maintenance can hide for years. These problems can lead to contamination of the ground, of wells, or nearby streams. So it's critical that the individuals who design, install, and repair septics be properly trained. And that's what this bill would do. House Bill 318 would bring much needed standards to the septic industry. It creates a board to oversee the licensing procedures for individuals in the industry, such as master and general installers, operations and maintenance providers, pumpers, and other categories of septic uh, professionals. The board established by the bill is just like the licensing boards for plumbers, electricians, well drillers, and other trade professionals. A key reason for this bill is that locally, licensing for septic professionals varies significantly from county to county. Some counties have no licensing requirements for installers, like Howard and Montgomery counties. Others may require a one-day class and a small fee. Others just require a fee. And so this scattershot approach to licensing does not provide the training or county or accountability that is very much needed. So the, this bill is, is the work of a group comprised of members of the septics industry and environmental organizations. They've worked for several years on the issue, seeking, seeking advice from the industry, environmental health officers, and environmental leaders. Compared to last year's bill, we've made a few changes to the bill, to this year's bill. The, in particular, the membership of the on-site wastewater board has been simplified. It still requires geographic diversity, but it'll be easier to pull together the board. Um, the bill's purpose is the same as last year, to bring much needed standards and accountability to the septic industry. And testifying today are several representatives from that industry and the environmental community. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I urge a favorable report. Okay, we're gonna go through all the proponents uh, and then we'll entertain questions. N next up is Matt Geckel. Matt, welcome back to the committee. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you for passing this bill last year and we ask you to try and do it one more time. As a longtime BAT installer, I've seen a number of problems with systems not designed properly, repaired well, or maintained appropriately. And septic systems are getting older and more and more are failing. And one of the causes of that also is climate change, which is making uh, the, the repairs more and more complicated and designs to adequately protect our health and environment. In my written testimony, I've given 10 quick examples that show the extent of the problem. These include one system on the Eastern shore that was so badly designed and installed and, and inspected that the new homeowner's dog got very ill and there was no one who could be held accountable and the new owner had to pay for the price of all the repairs. Many of these issues never come across the desk of environmental health officers because it is people like Eddie and myself who are called in to fix this mess. Remember that everyone involved in the house design and build operates under a licensing board. The industry that is responsible to protect your health and the environment from sewage should also be too. I would hope you would uh, give this uh, bill a favorable report and thank you very much. Well, thank, uh, thank you. Uh, next we'll hear from Edward 
Well, Eddie Harrison. Eddie, welcome back to the committee. Uh, you've got two minutes, sir. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Eddie Harrison. I'm here to represent Malpa, myself, and no one else. Thank you all for, your for, for the opportunity to speak in favor of this important piece of legislation to protect consumers, property values, public health, and the environment. Malpa and many other entities from the on-site wastewater industry have been discussing licensing and board and a board for many years. We, the industry, brought this in initiative to Delegate Stein. My lengthy written testimony covers the history of, the, of, the, of this effort and a number of details about the importance of bringing more standards to this industry. The key point that I want to make today is that the industry is calling for this professionalization and accountability. This is, this is not only important to ensure that on-site wastewater systems are better designed and maintained, but also provides a much clearer path for those who are interested in joining the profession. The board will be populated by many of the industry to, to ensure that the interests are represented. We want clear and consistent standards and more accountability for the, fewer, for the few bad actors. This will, board will make it easier for MDE to do its job, getting, getting better on-site wastewater system designs built and maintained properly and consistently will mean less problems for MDE to have to respond to. MDE, in, in the, in the on-site division is, is severely understaffed. Um, they're, they're, they just can't get to everything. Um, we, dis, we disagree that MDE cannot meet this bill timeline. The board will be charged with the hard work with most of the figuring things out. The MDE just has to approve it. There's nothing in this legislation that require haulers and pumpers to get multiple licenses. I mentioned that because that's uh, answering questions that are in MDE's comments. Um, thank you very much, and I, I urge you for a favorable report. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Emily Ranson with Clean Water Action. Emily, you're up next for two, for two minutes. All right. Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. I'm Emily Ranson with Clean Water Action. Ensuring that septic systems are well designed, installed correctly, serviced properly, and inspected appropriately is necessary for the home value, the health of the people living in and around the septic system, as well as the environment. I always like to remind everyone that a septic system is basically a tiny wastewater treatment plant, and its purpose is to make human waste safe to release into the yard. We think that an industry dealing with soil types, hydrologic flows, viruses and bacteria and construction should have a regulatory board to ensure work quality, consumer protection, and continuing education as technology and the understanding of how soils impact waste treatment changes. And so it's pretty surprising that this industry does not have a professional board, unlike home improvement contractors, electricians, plumbers, or well drillers. Basically, everyone involved with building or selling your home is licensed except the person ensuring that your raw sewage is handled safely. This bill, as uh, was stated, was uh, very similar to what was passed out of the committee last year, and the status quo is not working. Uh, poorly designed systems are still getting installed. They're being, um, and a septic system sits unseen in the yard and relies on a balance of soil, soil drainage and water flow to work. And so a homeowner needs the assurance and confidence that the correct system is being installed properly and our surface water and groundwater, the water that we drink, needs the protection of a well-designed and properly installed septic system. In Maryland, we use similar commissions and boards to regulate members of other industries like home appraisers, interior designers, locksmiths, barbers, and pawnbrokers. And I'd like to point out that Delaware Technical Community College has a really good model for training people to work in the on-site industry. And I will wrap it up. Um, that The fact that that program is able to exist is because they have consistency throughout the state. So thank you and we urge a favorable report. Thank you. Uh, next, let's, uh, yeah, let, next let's hear from Andrew uh, Lazur. Uh, Andrew, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes, sir. Thank you, and good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and, and committee members. I'm a statewide water quality specialist with the University of Maryland Extension, and I provide septic and private well education, primarily to homeowners. 
So this past summer, I worked with Senator Hester's office in surveying other states and how they uh, oversee uh, on-site systems. 35 states require state licensing for some or all sectors of the septic industry. All states essentially have some level of certification, as does Maryland. And in six states, Alabama, Mississippi, North Carolina, New Hampshire, and Virginia actually have state on-site licensing boards. We surveyed and interviewed uh, four of those states that have licensing boards, and, and, the, and the full report is attached uh, for you to, to review. But we wanted to identify the reasons why they established a board, how does the board function, uh, what would they include uh, in the board's duties, and what other recommendations would they have for uh, other states considering a licensing board. Um, as far as the reasons for the board to be established was uh, to uh, essentially develop minimum standards and qualifications for on-site professionals, provide oversight of those professionals, establish enforcement of standards and ethical conduct. About 50% of those uh, stated that. And then also to provide a mechanism for licensing and certification. Uh, the board functions varied among the states. Obviously, uh, licensing and regulating on-site professionals, uh, again, maintaining and established minimum standards of knowledge and experience to uh, ensure competency and ethical conduct. Uh, certainly, again, to provide uh, and protect environmental and public health. And then uh, also establish training and certification and provide- uh, Doctor, if you can wrap up your testimony, the committee okay. would appreciate that. Right. And then also to provide in, in, uh, enforcement procedures. So again, uh, summarized in my, both my testimony and, and the, and the uh, final report as well. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next, let's hear from Jean von Guten. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, Jean, uh, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. We were notified that Gene might not be able to make it today and he is not at the call. Okay, so I'm gonna make a slight change. There is one person testifying against, so I will um, recognize Heather Moritz, Moritz and then we'll go to questions. So Heather, welcome back. I believe you've been before our committee before. Welcome back. And you have two minutes. You're testifying against, against the bill. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Maryland Conference of Environmental Health Directors. Uh, my name is Heather Moritz, and I am currently the director of the Environmental Health Division in St. Mary's County. Uh, the conference requests an unfavorable report for House Bill 318 in that it is too broad in nature and is not supported by findings from various workshops held over the last several years. There have been numerous discussions between local health departments, Maryland Department of the Environment, and various stakeholders related to possible improvements needed in the on-site wastewater industry. It was widely agreed upon and found that the most contentious issue was with property transfer inspections. This will be addressed since the passing of Senate Bill 22 in 2021, which was highly agreed upon by most parties. The remainder of the professions in the on-site wastewater industry that are listed in House Bill 318 currently have oversight either through licensure with their local health department, certification requirements through Maryland Department of the Environment, or under an existing board such as a board of surveyors or, in, or engineers. Creation of a board adds another layer of certifications and licenses that are not necessary. Members of the industry and property owners will benefit more from improved collaboration between local health departments and MDE in order to set and implement consistent standards while including stakeholders in the discussions. This ideal was favored in regional workshops held in 2021 with there being less concern that the industry was not properly licensed or certified. Lastly, House Bill 318 proposes that the board can establish standards for the on-site wastewater industry. This is concerning and would allow a board to self-regulate an industry that has a substantial impact on the environment and public health. This is not a position or a risk that the conference can support, so we ask that the committee give an unfavorable report. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have several questions. The first will go to Delegate uh, Treasurer Hidalgo. Dave? 
I guess he doesn't have a question anymore. I do have a question. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Just a few questions, uh, Delegate Stein, Vice Chair Stein. So I heard earlier on you mentioned a couple of counties that do and do not have a process of licensure already. Can you repeat what those were? Uh, I can do that, sir. It's Howard, Montgomery, Cecil, Somerset, Charles, and I believe there's another one um, uh, um, in, in Western Maryland, but I, I don't want to say which one because I'm not sure. That do not have licensure or do, do not have ha do not have any licensing whatsoever to install septic systems. And and or maintain septic systems. Um well the pumper, the pumpers, the truck is licensed and the business is licensed. The operator is not in all counties. So the truck is licensed. What is that? What does that mean? The truck is well, licensed. the truck is licensed. They get inspected to make sure that they don't leak and that they have proper signage if for, for the public to identify the truck. Okay. And then and the pumper, but the actual coming out to someone's house and pumping out. A, a a septic tank that's not licensed or regulated in in any way. So that pumper no, can, can tell the homeowner anything they want, and there's no or, or do whatever they want since it doesn't happen very often. Most homeowners probably don't pump their septic tanks, and when they do, it's probably three or four or five years or even longer. So since they don't deal with that often, my guess is that most homeowners don't know very much about septic fields and septic tanks and maintenance. Exactly. And the introduction of the, or the more widely used uh, automated systems, uh, a lot of the pumpers, the truck drivers don't, are not familiar with these things. And they're, they're either, uh, most will walk away from them, but some of them will give bad advice for uh, the, pumper, uh, the homeowner calling to pump it. They pump it and break it. It happens every once in a while. So some okay. of the systems you pump them out, the pumps run dry and burns pumps up. All right. Uh, for the most part, when they're cleaning a septic tank, they just open it up and, you know, put a hose down there and suck all the waste out, right? Exactly. Exactly. All right. Um, yeah, I, I uh, as most people probably know, just barely enough to be really, really dangerous. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Next question goes to Delegate Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is for the uh, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, Delegate Stein, uh, uh, this, you said that this has changed very little from uh, the original bill that from a couple of years ago? That's, that's right. The composition of the board itself has been, um, has been consolidated, so we're Representing the diversity, but just not as not as many individuals. So yeah. and Go ahead. and um, Go ahead. and I'm sorry, delegate. And I don't know if there's anyone else on the call that can speak to any other. I know there were a couple minor changes, but I forget forget exactly what those were. Um, but I think that was the most sort of substantive change. The uh, question I I remember from the uh, I, I think I remember from the original bill where the uh, members of the board were diversified out in the different regions of the uh, of the state. Isn't it so that uh, what I'm reading here is that six individuals would be appointed by the governor uh, with the advice of the secretary and the advice and consent of the Senate for this board? Uh, isn't that a substantial different isn't that substantially different than what it was originally well i think the main difference is that uh rather than specifying particular regions we say that the on-site wastewater professional members of the board shall be representative of all regions of the state um yeah. so i think that's sort of you know how the how we're trying to get yeah. a geographic diversity in this case yeah, uh, you know, I was personally, wouldn't you feel? Would you feel a lot more comfortable with it being back to the way it was, uh, uh, designating the different regions of the state? Delegate, I'm happy to discuss that with you, and you know, consider an amendment that would put it in a, you know, same posture as it was before. So I remember we did have a meeting about this a couple of years ago. So 
Yeah. Um, happy to consider that. Well, thank you very much. And we'll, I'll get with you and do that. Thank Great. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question goes to Delegate Healy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Vice Chairman Stein, uh, I, my question, I kind of put it on my alumni of Ways and Means hat about <laughs> the fees that- Refugee, uh, refugee what, you mean. What? Refugee. Refugee, <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> The, the, the question, one of the things I did for many years was to, to bird dog all these boards and um, make sure that they set fees to cover the costs of operating their programs. And um, I didn't see any fees attached to this. If you're going to give people licenses that are, have value and, uh, and people don't have to actually just go to the um, staple store and get a card to say that they <laughs> have this profession, uh, then maybe um, if they're being regulated as a profession, they, they ought to also have fees to cover that regulation uh, so that it doesn't cost the department money. Uh, what do you, uh, did you consider that when you put the bill in? Yeah, yes, I mean, the intention is that the, the, the boards would charge uh, for licensing Okay. Um, I mean that there would be a fee associated with it, and and specifically also for you know before the board gets up and running and establishes standards statewide standards, we, we did put in there that for anyone who's already licensed, say by a local government, there'd be they'd have to pay a hundred fifty dollar uh, fee to to represent themselves as licensed until the state board gets up and running. So, okay. but bottom line, yes, is that um, the the um, the idea is that there would be fees for the licensing that would pay for the expenses of the, of the board. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question goes to Delegate uh, Jacobs, Delegate Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Delegate Stein, I was reading a letter from uh, MDE that's, that has, it's under the title of information, but it's really not an information letter. It's really an opposing letter. If you look, read different parts of it, I was just wondering what your reaction was. It talks about legislation proposed does not have any funding or wait a minute. Um, additionally, legislative mandated pro program or regulation such as this will likely hamper our efficiency, force us to divert resources away from current core compet competencies and, and likely disrupt customer service and diminish services. Um, there's, there's a number of statements in here. Um, uh, the last paragraph on the first page is talking about a number of work groups that were held in the state in the septic industry. The consensus was they did not view multiple licensing favorably. Um, and then uh, towards the end of the letter, this, this sentence kind of stuck out to me. This presents an overlap and conflict with the other two state boards and exist, existing provisions at Comar. So I'm just wondering how you view those uh, in relationship to the legislation. All right, let me address a few of those. And, and I don't think this should have been a letter of information is what I'm saying. <laughs> but you know how the, the, the me, departments won't sure. take the position, but. Sure. No, let me let me address a couple of those statements and then I'll defer to the to the professionals who are um, on the call to address a couple others. First of all, on the issue of diverting resources, as we just discussed with Delegate Healy, this board is paid for. It's not going to require any drain on MDE's existing resources. So there'll be revenue. And, you know, as the fiscal note uh, states, you know, the, the net effect is, is zero. Um, so I believe maybe uh, perhaps in the first year there is an expense, but then otherwise the net effect is, is zero in all the out years. So, so the expenses are covered. So I'm not sure why they say that. Um, the consent the, with respect to the work groups across the state. Now I just participated in one. I think others on the call participated in multiple work groups, but the one that I participated on, there was no consensus. So I, I don't under, and, and there was no report or minutes from those from from those work groups that MDE issued in which there was any discussion of any consensus. Um, and you know, so there there was a wide range of opinion by the contractors um, that were on the one call that I was on as to whether they favored statewide licensing. Um, and 
and I guess someone, I, I forget who it was, maybe it was Eddie said that, doesn't know why they say that there would be two or three categories for licensing under the board. The issue that sort of the, the, the statutory definition, I'm not sure why um, the State Board of Waterworks and Waste System Operators, is, it, as I understand it, deals with large wastewater systems. Um, so I, I'm not clear as to why they think that this would somehow infringe upon that board's work. If there was any clarification that MDE is suggesting to make that absolutely clear, be happy to consider that. Haven't seen anything from MDE. Um, and, and with that, Delga Jacobs, if you don't mind, if I could ask the other folks who are on the call, if they want to elaborate on anything I said. And if I might add, uh, before they get on, you know, there's one sentence here towards the end, it says, this presents an overlap and conflict with the other, with the two other state boards and existing provisions at Comar. That's what I like to kind of hear something on that, if I could. Yeah, okay. Well, with respect to the State Board of Waterworks, again, I, I don't understand why they, my understanding is that regulates you know, municipal, municipal wastewater systems, not septics. Um, maybe I'm wrong on that, but if I'm correct, I don't see how there'd be any overlap. With, this, with respect to the State Board of Environmental Health Specialists, um, the idea here is to provide consistent state regulation for all septics professionals. So there, there may already be, with respect to pieces of sort of the septics world that the State Board of Environmental Health Specialists uh, regulates. But again, I, if I could defer to the others on the call, they, they would know for sure. All right, thank you for, for those answers. Sure. Is there anybody else who'd like to uh, respond to that? I can. Mr. Geckel, yeah, go ahead. Um, the, wa the wastewater board currently uh, covers systems 5,000 gallons per day and up. The typical on-site wastewater system residential is about 500 gallons a day. So it's not in their, it's not in their wheelhouse. As far as the uh, licensed environmental health specialist, they are exempt from this bill. So we're not even touching them. Okay. Anything else from anyone? Uh, could I could I get uh, sure Heather uh, Moritz to respond in, in uh, based on that conversation? I know she's on the other side. I'm, it's it's a it's confusing to me to read this information from from uh, yeah Heather Heather. Do you want to respond to any of this? I mean, I can try, but I mean, I wasn't. Um part of the discussion but that's that's coming from MDE directly as opposed to um, the environmental health conference um, but you know there is essentially a board that does oversee our septic contractors and that is those that are licensed under the board of environmental health specialists you know as as an environmental health specialist in the state of Maryland it is my responsibility to oversee the work that these installers do to inspect the work that they do to and um, you know review designs that are that are submitted for septic systems that are to be installed with within the different jurisdictions. So I don't know if they're speaking of maybe that kind of overlap or if it's more dealing with when it comes time to you know promulgate regulations that is done by Maryland Department of the Environment, which is then, you know, passed on to us to review, discuss, and that also involves, you know, a lot of times discussions with stakeholders and everything. So I don't know if maybe that's where it's at too, is that it's kind of flipping um, who essentially starts those reg proposals, those regulation proposals. Okay, well, you. Jay, I'm going to move on to Delegate Weivel, if that's okay with Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Delegate Weivel has the next question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd kind of like to direct my question, I guess, to Vice Chair Stein and uh, Ms. Moritz. So um, last year, MAKO supported licensure for the property inspectors, but they didn't believe there was enough evidence to warrant the actual creation of a board. Um, this year, they didn't weigh in. I'm kind of curious, if, uh, Delegate Stein, if we know why MAKO didn't weigh in this year. And then 
Ms. Mortz, if you could comment in regards to licensing inspectors versus creation of a board, if you have an opinion on that. Yeah, Delegate, I'll just say I do not know um, uh, why MAKO decided to take no position on this bill. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mako's actually here. Can I answer that? No. Oh, okay. Yes. Absolutely. Sure. So, sure. Uh, well, yeah. So, I believe um, in this particular bill um, that there's actually a carve out for local government employees. So, that's true. Yeah. So that's why um, Mako decided not to to get in. So your counties uh, have no opinion on it then? Uh, no. The um, it preserves our local licensure um, stuff so we can still issue licenses under this bill. Um, local employees are, don't have to get one of these licenses. So um, the effect on counties is, is nil. Well, it's, it's not nil, it affects your constituency, but anyhow. Ms. Moritz, do you, have a, do you have any comments on the licensing of the inspectors? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, through many discussions and then just many, you know, going back and doing our own audit of what kind of issues we've had in our own counties is that we could all agree that there was a major gap in these property transfer inspections. You know, we had um, companies that did not know really the ins and out of a septic system on how to properly um, inspect it to see if it's functioning hydraulically. Um, and, and didn't even have the proper equipment to, to do that proper inspection. So um, that, for that, that is a huge, that has a huge impact on property owners, especially when they're getting an inspection where, you know, they, that's a company that isn't necessarily qualified is saying, yes, this, this thing is, this system is working. And as soon as somebody puts it into use, they find that it's not. Um, that's where we found the, the biggest gap and the biggest impact on property owners. What we weren't finding was a significant number of illegal, illegal septic systems being installed or premature failure, failures within three years. Um, I think a lot of it has to go, you know, as far as these minimal premature failures that there might be found, it's not necessarily always on the inspection, the install, you know, sometimes property owners have to be held accountable for how they use their system as well. A septic system is the most expensive appliance that they have at their house. And if they don't take care of it, it's not going to work. If you don't change the oil in your car, it's not gonna work. So it's not so much that we need to have this, this board to really set up this licensing. And this, this isn't, you, I don't think you can lump this profession in with electricians. An electrician can go to St. Mary's, to Allegheny, to Cecil, and that electricity isn't going to change. It's the same electrical current you're gonna find anywhere. Whereas what I find and what I need my septic contractors to know in St. Mary's may be completely different than what somebody needs in Allegheny. There, it's, it's not a cookie cutter, this is the standard, this is what you do in every single county because there is so much diversity in septic systems. And it's not because we don't wanna be consistent, it's because soils are different. Um, the, the, the whole geology is different. The, the uses on the systems are different. So um, it, it, it's a, it was very easy to really look at those property transfer inspectors and say, we need to do something about this because people are purchasing homes with systems that somebody that has been around septic systems long enough would know that it should never pass um, as, as a functioning system. And that, you said that was addressed in a Senate Bill 22 in a prior session. What, what year was that, do you know? Uh, 2021. Okay, so it's relatively new and that's in place now? Uh, that's, that's what will be worked on. So that was part of, that was what we were in favor of as far as this original bill, as far as the wastewater industry is we support it if it's only for the property transfer inspectors. But you believe yeah. that's you believe that's address the issue? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Are there any further questions? Uh, I don't see any hands up. So that ends the public hearing on House Bill three eighteen. 
Let's turn now to House Bill 361, Delegate Henson. Welcome to the committee. You've got four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee, for hearing this bill today. House Bill 361 is a bill to adopt statewide standards for the inspection, detection, and remediation of mold in rental housing. Uh, this bill is on its third introduction. It's a very similar form this year that's been introduced in prior years with some notable differences. Um, the differences are the result of spending time during the interim working with stakeholders on this bill. Um, I saw a few of them signed up today to testify unfavorably. That was really disappointing because we did spend a lot of time trying to hammer out some of the fine points of this so that the bill could have balance on both the landlord and tenant side of the equation. When you look at the text of the bill, it starts off with some basic definitions defining what is dampness, what is mold, what is a mold assessment, what is a mold hazard, and what does it mean to remediate that mold. The bill then goes into a timeline for the bill's implementation. It gives the Department of the Environment until January 1st, 2024 to adopt regulations for identifying and evaluating mold. So we did delay that implementation to January 1st, 2024 after conversations with the department to try to give them ample time to convene the stakeholders that are listed in the bill to be able to adopt the best regulation. So this bill itself does not have that regulation. That would be done by a work group of experts coming together, spending several years to adopt regulations that would then be effective. The bill pulls together Maryland Department of Health, Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, and our very own DGS to adopt these standards. We'll note that DGS has some very recent past experience with mold standards because it was DGS who was called upon to remediate the mold that was found and our very own Department of Legislative Services building. So DGS is able to be at that table to make sure that the standards that we've applied across the state to our own employees are able to be applied to rental housing. After the standards are adopted, the procedure for implementing the bill happens at the local level. On page six of the bill's text, lines 20 through 25, it talks about the local inspections. There would be no more inspections required than are currently being done by our local code enforcement offices. But when our code enforcement officers are on site and they are inspecting, the bill would have them inspect for potential mold. What that means is that we're not asking our local code enforcement officers to develop an expertise as it relates to mold. We're not asking them to do air samples or core samples. We're asking them to use their wisdom, judgment, skill, and training to identify potential mold. Once a code enforcement officer spots potential mold, they would then contact the landlord, the property's owner, and they would tell them that they have the duty to inspect, test, or remediate that mold. It gives our code enforcement officers that ability. After the landlord's been notified of their need to inspect, test, or remediate the mold, the bill then would have the standards adopted for which the landlord would conduct that work. One of the things that the bill also does is it gives the local code enforcement offices the ability con to contract with a third party to do these inspections if for some reason our locals are not already inspecting or if they don't wanna take on inspecting for potential mold. The bill is enforced in three ways. One of the ways is the imposition of a civil penalty. It gives our local code enforcement offices and county governments and city governments the ability to find landlords that don't comply with these standards. The second is the tenant's rights. It gives the tenant the ability to put their rent in rent escrow as opposed to continuing to pay a landlord who's found to violate this statute. With the rent escrow statute, as we know, tenants cannot avail themselves of that remedy until they have notified their landlord and the landlords had a reasonable opportunity to make the repairs. So in that instance, it would be after notice and an opportunity, then a tenant could avail themselves of rent escrow. And the third way that it is enforced is that it protects tenants from retaliatory evictions after they have used this statute to get the mold remediated in their rental housing. The last and newest component of the bill is a tax credit. Tax credit is addressed on page 11. It provides up to $10,000 for property owners who have remediated mold to offset those costs. 
The tax credit will be administered on a first come first served basis by an application. That application will be vetted by vetted by the Department of Housing. Delegate, if you could start to wind up a bit, the committee would appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The tax credit would cap at six hundred thousand dollars, and it would sunset after ten years. Thank you for your consideration of House Bill three sixty one. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Let's go through the witnesses in favor. First is Lance Eisen. Lance, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and everybody else that's here uh, on this meeting. Um, we really appreciate being involved with this. My name is Lance Eisen. I'm the Executive Vice President of NORMI with Business Development. And we teach and work with legislative affairs in different states to help them through the process of uh, pushing these laws and bills through. Uh, we were stakeholders with the state of Florida, Louisiana, Washington, D.C., New York State. And we're the only training provider that works in all five states that require licensing. So I applaud you for putting a license or trying to put a licensing law in place for this. It's, it's definitely needed. Um, I, I looked at the bill uh, that you have proposed right now. It's a great, great start. Uh, it's very similar to the D.C. bill. Uh, from working with them, I recognize a lot of points in there that are very similar with that. And um, I think the rules and regulations that follow is where, I guess, the leaves on the tree start to really be filled in. If this bill is the tree itself, the uh, leaves are what the rules and regulations do. And we are more than willing to work with you in any way possible that we can to assist with our background in doing this for, for almost 20 years and working with the other states that have put this in place. Um, Truthfully, I just want to say it's a really great start, and I'm really, really glad that you guys are putting something in place for this. Okay, thank you very much. Let's next go to Zephyr Shah. Zephyr, welcome back to the committee. Hey, thank you, Chair Barve, Vice Chair Stein, and members of the committee. I'm Zephyr Shah, a housing attorney at the Public Justice Center. Uh, we provide legal services uh, in representation to hundreds of renter households throughout the state. And we consistently find that our clients, whether they're in a single family or a multifamily property, are facing dangerous mold conditions. And they, they face those conditions pretty much on their own. Uh, we know that mold is a hazard because we see the health impact in our clients physically. They have respiratory ailments and rashes. They have doctor's notes. And although we advise uh, our clients that they have a remedy through local code, enforcement or through rent escrow actions in the district court, we know that those remedies generally fail because of the systemic failure caused by, um, at the you know fundamental level, that there is no definition of a mold hazard uh, in our state and that in our building and our property maintenance codes, there is not language to actually identify mold. And on page two of my written testimony, I've shown you what's actually a better case scenario for one of my clients where the housing code uh, violation notice refers to possible mold. Other clients of ours have had uh, notices for black substance uh, or uh, unsanitary condition. Um, so there's not a standard for inspecting mold. Uh, there, there's therefore not mold specific training for local code enforcement. And without those, renters have no standard to hold their landlords accountable. Um, this is why renters routinely see that their complaints to code uh, enforcement res are resolved by, for instance, just covering up the mold. So we have a policy in Maryland, which is if you cover up the problem, you don't have the problem. Um, some of the oppositions to this bill, as uh, Delegate Henson mentioned, are about whether there's a, pro a requirement for proactive uh, mold testing and what the cost of that would be to localities. But I want to just really emphasize that even reactive complaint driven inspection of mold is completely, the outcomes are completely determined on whether you have the inspection testing or mediation standards in this bill without that fundamental uh, sort of block of code and law. Uh, tenants really ha are, are on their own. They, they have very little to use uh, when they need redress for mold conditions in the property. Our view is that by setting up uh, these definitions and standards, you'll be well on your way to improving housing and health in Maryland. Um, 
We do have some concerns about preemption language in the RONESCO provisions and some confusing language about what the remedies would be under this bill compared to the existing RONESCO statute. Uh, we've addressed those concerns through a sponsor amendment on the Senate side and have talked to Delegate Hansen about those. Uh, okay. But we, we urge that the, the committee move this bill this year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, let me recognize whoever is speaking on behalf of Maryland Legal Aid. Good, morning. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Sunny Desai. I'm a chief attorney at Maryland Legal Aid. Uh, Maryland Legal Aid is a private nonprofit law firm that provides free civil legal services to low-income Marylanders across the state. Uh, as an example, last year we handled over 6,000 housing law cases, so we've encountered this type of issue quite often across the state. We asked that uh, for a favorable report on House Bill 361, as we believe it has a chance to do some real good for the tenants of Maryland without creating an undue burden um, on the landlords. Uh, as in uh, our written testimony has been submitted, but uh, there's a, I have a recent example of a client who's facing a mold issue in their apartment. Um, we have filed rent escrow. We will represent this client in court, but we are at the mercy of the inspector. If the landlord happens to paint over the mold and they, before the inspector shows up and the inspector doesn't uh, note that there was mold there, um, that puts our tenant, our client at a great disadvantage. This bill has a chance to uh, provide some more remedies for the tenant, provide a more incentive for the landlord not to take that, certain landlords not to take that action. Uh, you know, the right to safe, habitable housing, we believe is a human right. And this bill has a chance to get Maryland closer to that. And, and for those reasons, uh, we echo uh, uh, PJC's testimony that was just given. Um, and we ask for a favorable report on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. Um... Let's proceed to hear from uh, Carissa Hatfield. Carissa, you are uh, welcome back to the committee. You've got two minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Barve and members of the committee. Um, as the chairman said, my name is Carissa Hatfield and I am a staff attorney with the Homeless Persons Representation Project, which provides representation to tenants in Baltimore City, Prince George's and Montgomery counties. Um, I don't want to say too much because I feel like my colleagues, Mr. Shaw, and Mr. Desai, have said pretty much everything that needs to be said about why this bill is so important. Um, I do want to add um, that while the current solution that many tenants receive is that the landlord paints over or washes off the mold, it does not solve the problem. The mold returns, it always does. Um, often it returns worse than ever. Um, and many of our clients face uninhabitable conditions that they currently can do almost nothing about. Um, and then for those reasons, we would uh, request a favorable report on House Bill 361. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, let's uh, turn to Ruth Ann Norton. Um, Ruth Ann, welcome back to the committee. You've got two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, and thank you, Delegate Henson, for what I think is a uh, extraordinarily well thought out bill. I'm Ruth Ann Norton. I'm president and CEO of the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. We're the nation's largest and foremost authority on health-based housing in the United States. Um, the presence of mold is a well-established trigger of asthma episodes and contributes to other negative health conditions. Due to the presence of mold in residential properties and the lack of an existing mechanism in Maryland for tenants to effectively seek the repair of mold hazards, legislation is critically needed to ensure that regulations are put in place to properly inspect and remediate mold exposure. Mold is a threat to life, health, and safety and occurs due to poor and inadequate ventilation, leaking roofs, water infiltration, effectively adherence uh, with housing code. It has a devastating impact on our most vulnerable children and older adults who suffer from respiratory diseases, asthma and COPD. In fact, in Maryland has over 600,000 adults and 232,000 children affected by asthma and respiratory disease. And it's the number one reason that kids are missing school in the state of Maryland and the number one reason that parents have missed work days. In fact, Maryland spends $42 million annually for asthma-related hospitalizations and $93 million for asthma-related emergency room visits. According to the Robert Wood Johnson Commission on Building a Healthier America, 40% of that cost is avoidable by 
repairing the health of housing standards. We think this is also critically important because mold is the number one reason that housing intervention for weatherization and lead hazard control is stopped in its tracks in our most uh, lowest income communities. It is the issue that left unrepaired or not attended to means that we will leave kids with serious lead hazards, families with uh, poor weatherization and not the, losing the opportunity to get critical um, services that are needed to create a more holistic and healthy housing standard. Maryland needs to join the 15 other states around the country that have moved forward uh, to adopt the standards of, of uh, identifying yeah. and remediating. Ruthanne, if you could wrap up, uh, the committee would appreciate I'm it. I'm done. Uh, we ask for your support uh, for House Bill, uh, House Bill uh, th 361. Here Thank to answer you. questions. Thanks so much, Ruthanne. And let's go to Dominic, uh, Dominic Butchko with uh, MAKO, We're, and you're signed up favorable with amendments. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the committee for having me here today. Uh, my name is Dominic Wischko, Associate Policy Director at the Maryland Association of Counties. MAKO asks that the committee give HB 361 a favorable report with amendments. And really quick, I just wanna praise Delicate Henson for the hard work she's doing to find consensus on this bill. I know that this has been at least a year or two in the making. Um, this bill aims to strike a balance between ensuring that these units are thoroughly inspected while at the same time placing the obligation of confirmation and remediation on the landlord and not the taxpayer. Um, that being said, counties do have two concerns. Um, our first one is, yes, we do agree with the intent, and thank you, Delegate Hen Henson, for underlining this, that there will be no more inspections than are currently going on. Um, we just want to make sure that that language is a little clearer and a little stronger. Um, the way it's written right now, we're afraid that could be interpreted differently. Um, our second amendment would just be that there's a preemption on local escrow laws. Some counties' local escrow laws, if there was mold, actually go farther. So um, our amendment would be just that there is a, a floor and not a ceiling so that counties can go above and beyond um, should, should local needs call for that. Um, on balance, HB 361 um, is intended for public health um, to deal with constrained local resources and puts the rightful responsibility on landlords. But to fully meet all of this, um, it does require amendments. So accordingly, MAKO urges the committee um, a fa to give a favorable report with amendments. Thank you. Okay, I'm, you know, there are two people, excuse me, three people signed up in opposition so we'll hear from them and then we'll go to questions for everyone who has testified. So first up will be Bill Costelli. Bill, welcome back to the committee. You've got two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, Bill Costelli with the Maryland uh, Association of Realtors. And we're opposed to the legislation. Um, we have uh, concerns about the fact that we don't really have a mold standard right now. Um, you've heard some of the other folks who've testified already mentioned that. And yet uh, the bill would establish protocols without a standard being in place yet. So we have concerns about that. Um, secondly, uh, one of our biggest concerns is that we already include in our standard lease term, a provision that talks about mold and moisture. And one of the one of the things in our lease, uh, our, our standard lease that we provide, is just notice that to the tenant because the tenant has a pretty significant responsibility when there is any kind of water intrusion in the property that could lead to mold. Um, and managing that, notifying the landlord about it, so that the landlord can take the steps necessary to take care of the problem. Um, I will tell you that. Uh, we have had property managers managing single family homes where, you know, a tenant has turned off, for example, a dehumidifier in the basement because de dehumidifiers do, uh, in fact, draw a lot of electricity. So, um, and that, of course, turned into a mold situation in the basement that was very expensive to correct in the single family home. So there's a big tenant responsibility in, in all of these as well. Um, and finally, as far as rent escrow, I think we would be fine with a rent escrow provision, just making it clear that a tenant um, that has a mold problem can make sure that that gets fixed uh, by the landlord. Um, but, you know, establishing some of these other inspection protocols, you know, 
prior to actually knowing what those standards are does concern us. And for that reason, we would recommend an unfavorable report. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next, let's hear from Justin Fiore with MML. Thank you and good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair and committee members. Justin Fiore here on behalf of the Maryland Municipal League. I also wanna start by thanking the sponsor and former municipal official for her dedication to the issue and openness to working with us to move Maryland forward. Uh, while MML is opposed to House Bill 361 as introduced, we have had recent conversations with the sponsor and believe we're close to a good solution that matches the framework we've discussed over the past few years, um, which really has three pillars. The first is leveraging existing inspections and code enforcement operations. And I think the sponsor shares our intention there to do that, um, but smarter people than me have read this to require full proactive inspections by all jurisdictions rather than the mix of proactive and reactive solutions used by jurisdictions depending on their resources. Um, the second part is when our folks see what they believe to be mold. Uh, a full inspection of a property will make sense where a full inspection is already taking place um, through like a rental licensing uh, inspection, for example. But if it's code enforcement, it might not align with what we're doing there where you could be called out to look at a localized spot in the living room that's not mold. Um, it wouldn't necessarily make sense then to inspect the full property for mold potentially going into a crawl space um, or other areas of the house that the resident or tenant aren't necessarily ready to avail to someone coming into their place. Usually you would get that inspection notification ahead that would give them a heads up, hey, this person needs to go through your full place. Uh, the third part is the, the next steps. And I think we're again on the same page here, which is notifying the landlord of their responsibility um, and it's amazing that we have the authority to enforce that through our code en enforcement, um, but also to rely on the rent escrow process in smaller jurisdictions that don't have staff to administer it. Um, with this, I do actually believe we can get to a position of support, and we're happy to continue having conversations with the sponsor and committee. Okay, and next let's go to Aaron Greenfield. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Aaron Greenfield on behalf of MMHA, you have our written testimony and we are here in opposition to House Bill 361. I also appreciate the ongoing discussions we've had with the sponsor um, and the changes she's made so far, but unfortunately they don't uh, address our continued concerns. One is the mold assessment is automatically triggered by a possible sighting of mold by an inspector, which comes at a fairly significant price. The landlord has no other option uh, to address uh, that mildew, you know, the, the, the wet stain, the potential mold. Uh, while we certainly appreciate the uh, tax credit for mold remediation, we're concerned about the cost associated with the mold assessment for, again, possible siting of mold. The bill also presumes retaliation if a landlord evicts, terminates the tenancy, or raises the rent if the tenant elects to seek remedies under the bill. Uh, our concern, similar to Mr. Castelli's, is you know, what if the tenant causes the mold uh, or um, if the mold requires such significant work that requires termination of tenancy, uh, you know, in which the, the tenant has to leave that tenancy. You know, the, the fact that we would face retaliation seems, all, you know, seems unfair. And there's also a statute in existence that already addresses retaliatory uh, actions. It frankly is just not needed here. And then as you heard, uh, you know, we, we believe tenants already have the right to utilize the health department and uh, code officials uh, for uh, issuing citations. In Baltimore City, there's just a hearing this morning where housing inspectors made clear that they're capable of issuing housing violation notices for interior issues with the appearance of mold because they too are, are not able, as most inspectors aren't, able to actually test for and determine mold. Um, and once that uh, it, uh, that citation is issued, the landlord must clean it up, remediate it, test it in order to satisfy the housing inspector or a judge in a rent escrow action. We um, also agree with Mr. Castelli about perhaps maybe focusing more on rent escrow and adding mold to the, the, the delineated list. Uh, and then lastly, Mr. Mr. Chairman, just again to reemphasize the point that uh, this bill neglects to account for a tenant's role in causing mold. Uh, mold can grow to a tenant failing to notify a landlord of any type of a leak or uh, if there are ventilation issues 
or if indoor airborne moisture is not controlled and a resident's windows are chronically fogged and wet, condens condensation is uh, reaching other cool surfaces, surfaces. This can uh, only be controlled by if a tenant. If you're going to begin to wrap up, I yeah. have a number uh, of questions. So. Sure. For, for those reasons, we uh, respectfully request an unfavorable report. Very well, then. The first question goes to Delegate Healy. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I want to thank Delegate Henson for bringing this bill. It's a concern I've had uh, for a while. I wanted to ask about the scope of the bill. Is it just for housing, for rental, uh, for, or is it for every building in the state? Delegate, for the question, it's for rental housing. Okay, because um, I, I know that there's, and I had a bill in, in previous years about uh, schools. Uh, mold has been a problem in some of our schools. And I just wanted to find out if you'd be open to like expanding this to include uh, government buildings, including the schools. That are that friendly to the bill. And I would um, think that the framework that the bill calls for adopting by regulation would easily be transferable to other buildings where people are spending time. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, next question goes to Delegate Lehman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Delegate Henson, thank you so much for your tenacity in, in pursuing this issue. Um, it's so important. I know you put a lot, a lot of work into it. Um, I'd like to ask you if you could comment briefly about the lesson of the Department of Legislative Services and, and what conversations, if any, um, you've had with the Department of General Services about the extent of that mold problem. How do they decide, for example, at what point it became so onerous and so unhealthy for our state employees to be in that building that they start, A, began moving them out, and now B, we, we know that that whole building, in fact, is going to be demolished because my understanding is the extent of that mold is just so, um, you know, so broad and, and so problematic that it cannot be remediated. What, what do you know just briefly about that? And what, what if any lessons, you know, um, can be applied to what you're trying to do in residential uh, rental housing? For the question, Delegate Lehman, I did have the opportunity to speak with um, the folks here at the state of Maryland that were tackling that issue. The standard used by DGS there was a measure of parts per million and it was a standard adopted by the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning. They were able to pull from those professional standards to make determinations about the safety and habitability of our building here. The particular standard that was used by DGS in that instance is also the subject of Senate Bill 302 this year, a bill that deals with um, Legionnaire's disease and indoor air quality as well. So we do know that they have a standard that they use internally and it's one of the reasons why I believe they'll be a valuable member of the stakeholders that are adopting a statewide standard by regulation. Yeah, th very briefly, Mr. Chairman, thank you for that answer. That's that's really interesting. And, and I, you're, you talking about your bill put, put me in mind of Delegate Stewart's uh, Legionnaire's bill as well. But um, why, so is there any reason why that standard that you cited that was used by DGS is not just transferable to rental housing. Um, you know, why is it any different for an employee in a workplace for on average less time, you know, eight hours a day or so versus someone's home? For the question, Delegate Lehman, um, that's in our hands now. We have the ability to adopt it as a statewide standard and to allow it to be utilized for inspections of mold and detection of mold and remediation of mold in rental housing but that's not the statewide standard simply because we have not adopted it by code or regulation. Great, thank you so much. And again, thank you for your work. Uh, the next question will go to Delegate Terraza. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and just, just first to follow up on that issue of the standard, I know that um, Mr. Castelli referenced this not having a standard. And I guess clearly there, as you said, um, Delegate Henson, there was some standard by which they were um, able to determine to immediately pull the folks out of um, the building. Um, but um, Mr. Shaw said um, something about there being no definition of mold. And I just wanted to clarify what Mr. Shaw meant by that because 
I, I believe what you were saying is there's no standard in the law right now. And that's what we're looking at doing. Not, well, I don't see Mr. Shaw. Maybe he's just not on my screen yeah. right now. But um, I just want to clarify, you didn't mean that there's no standard to look at and there's no standard to be discussed in this group and decided on. You meant there's no standard in the law, so it's very difficult to bring the cases. Is no, that that's Mr. right. Mr. Shaw's here. Great. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Delegate Teresa. So just to be really clear, when we're talking about the building code, uh, property maintenance code that are adopted at each local level, and then if you're just looking at the real property article or any other uh, article applicable to rental housing, there there is no black letter um, definition or standard related to mold or testing or remediation. From a legal perspective, but there certainly are standards right. out there that have been used scientifically. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the other question, and I'm not sure, um, Delegate Henson, who would be best to answer this, but could somebody speak a little bit more about the health impacts of mold? I mean, I heard, um, I think it was Mr. Shaw mentioned them, but um, and about all the problems that he saw in terms of his clients. But is there some? Is, is there a little bit more that you could expand on the the health impacts? Because I think we're sort of just talking about mold as if it's a thing that exists in an apartment but not really what the impact is on, on real people that live there. Question, Delegate Tarasa. Um, in the years past, we've had pulmonologists that were able to come in and testify from Luminous Health System, and they've done a great job at really explaining what it's like when there's ER visits, when the asthma-related respiratory complications crop up. The panel that we're able to have with us today, I'd like to ask if I can, Ruth Ann from Green and Healthy Homes to take on the issue of how it impacts people's health. Yeah, uh, thank you and uh, thank you for the question. It, uh, we know uh, both uh, scientifically and medically uh, that exposure to mold uh, has an extraordinary exacerbation on children with uh, respiratory airways disease, uh, asthma, and older adults with COPD, they, it, it pretty much doubles their uh, rate of admission on a hospital basis and on uh, an emergency room basis. And as I uh, noted earlier, um, it, it has other impacts on sort of uh, emotional health and the like that has been shown to be linked to depression uh, and other uh, aspects uh, that are a side of effect of having uh, severe asthma. So it, we, we do know in the cases that we're looking at too, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation looked at this and about 40% of the cases in the state of Maryland that we are looking at are avoidable uh, if we improve indoor air quality and uh, which, improve, which is incumbent that we reduce and remove mold in housing um, in order to do this. The main impact is on um, respiratory health. There are studies that show impact on cognitive uh, impairment uh, because of mold. And we do know, and there are documented cases of a severe respiratory reaction uh, to mold that has resulted in death. Uh, so it has very serious impacts on exacerbating uh, the respiratory disease. Uh, in because of the concentration in housing that it's getting into the air systems and uh, the concentration of exposure. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, next question goes to uh, Delegate um, Love. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is for Ms. Norton. Um, Ms. Norton, it's my understanding that passing this bill will open more resources from the federal government to benefit property owners. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, it, it, two ways, and thank you, Delegate Love, for that question. 62% of the time uh, that we are looking at weatherization dollars, uh, energy efficiency dollars that address indoor air quality, that address uh, leaky roofs, that address Uh, we lost you there for a second. Ruth Ann, can you guys hear me? Because I can't hear her. I believe she's disconnected, unfortunately. Oh, there she is. Okay, good. You're back. Uh, oh, did you, I go just, away? 
you did, and we missed the last 30 to 45 Well, basically, we, we miss out on about 62% of weatherization dollars being able to go to the most needy families uh, because of mold, mildew, moisture deferrals that happen. But what passage of this bill with the standards will do is put the state of Maryland in a better position to be also able to tap uh, funding from the Office of uh, Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Housing at HUD uh, for healthy homes production dollars that the state would be more eligible, have a higher eligibility. Also under the Department of Energy, uh, there is now pre-weatherization dollars that the state would have a higher rate of uh, being able to tap if they can point to a standard of care around mold. So we would not only save at least 10, $20 million a year in Medicaid cost out of the 42 million that we are spending, but we would also be able on the flip side to be able to capture another 10 million a year. So we would have a pretty significant net benefit, all of which would inure to the rental property owner um, ability to access dollars to help uh, remedy this issue by having that standard. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for the uh, uh, sponsor. Not so much question. I, I'd like you to react to something. I, I don't think we can end this public hearing without me allowing you to respond in some way to the concern that property owners have that renters might be the cause of mold in certain circumstances. Do you have a reaction to that? the opportunity to react and respond to that. Um, I think that several remedies were mentioned by the property owners um, in their testimony. And one of the most important ones is that our property owners have to be engaged with their renters. Being a landlord is an ongoing commitment and the ability to inspect properties that you own to make sure that those properties are safe and habitable is a feature of a Maryland law and a feature of every standard landlord tenant lease and lease agreement. So property owners that are utilizing that feature to make sure that their investment is well maintained will be on notice and aware of potential mold and have the ability to jump in at the outset and educate tenants if necessary, enforce the terms of their lease if necessary, and conduct the necessary work to make sure that a small problem doesn't turn into a large problem. But I certainly don't wanna think that what our landlords and their advocates are asking for is the ability for them to sign lease agreements with people and walk away from those tenants without having to maintain the property at a livable standard. Okay. Um... There appear to be no further questions from the members of our committee. And so thank you one and all, and that will end the public hearing on House Bill 361. Let's proceed to House Bill 371, Delegate Chi. Welcome back to the committee. Good afternoon, Chair Barbie and members of the ENT committee. I am a Delegate Chi, I am Lily Chi. I am truly excited to appear in front of this committee uh, where I will be presenting my bill for the very first time here. Uh, this is also a committee where two of my district mates serve, Delegate Fraser Hidalgo and Delegate Foley. HB 371 establish, establishes a SALT applicator training program and a certification program within the Maryland Department of the Environment, MDE, to reduce road salt. This is a very timely topic for this time of the year. Because of the winter weather, we are seeing a lot of salt on the roads and we see a lot of salt trucks spraying generously on our roadways, parking lots and the sidewalks, sometimes way beyond the snow season. That's because salt is cheap, but the real cost of excess road salt is our health and the environment. Road salt eventually runs off the roadways and into our waterways. Salt can harm or even kill vegetation and wildlife and increases sodium levels in our drinking water, which cannot be easily taken out without extraordinary costs as confirmed by WSSC. Our over, 
Oversalting also leads to the corrosion of our infrastructure, such as bridges, pipes, and buildings, and even our vehicles. In recent years, there has been an increased awareness of the impact of oversalting. You might have seen reporting in the media, including the Washington Post, the New York Times, and there have been numerous studies on this subject too. Currently in the state of Maryland, all public contractors applying salt on our highways and publicly maintain the roads already have to comply with the state's smart salt program administered by the State Highway Administration and the Maryland Department of the Environment. But there is no equivalent for the private contractors that are applying salt everywhere else in our neighborhoods, in commercial parking lots or sidewalks. This bill fills that void. HB 371 requires MDE to establish a salt applicator training and a certification program for the private contractors to encourage efficient use of road salt, just as the state is already doing with the public contractors. The certification is valid for three years. Along with the certification, salt applicators are expected to keep track of the amount of salt they are using and to share that data with MDE. As an update, MDE is already in the process of developing the Smart Salt certifi Certification Program at our request. For this legislation, our team has had multiple conversations with MDE and with SHA over the past two years to explore different angles of addressing this issue. We believe this is a very sensible and reasonable approach through raising awareness and collecting data to inform future policies. Finally, this program's implementation date is set in two years, in 2022, to allow MDE ample time and resources to implement the program. With that, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to turn to my supporting panel. Absolutely. Uh, first on the list is Stephen Schofer with the Montgomery County government. Stephen, welcome back to the committee. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Barve, Vice Chair Stein, and members of the committee. My name is Stephen Shofar. I'm the Division Chief of Intergovernmental Affairs in Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection, speaking on behalf of Mark Elbridge, the County Executive. The County Executive strongly supports passing House Bill 0371, enabling legislation for creation of a commercial salt applicator certification program. Salt application is a key component in keeping our roads safe for travel during winter weather. Any action taken to reduce the use of salt must not negatively affect the safety of our roads. However, salt is a pollutant that negatively affects the environment, infrastructure, and our drinking water supply. Salt is a persistent pollutant that does not break down in the environment over time. Salt's corrosive to infrastructure, can accelerate the deterioration of concrete, cause scaling of pipes, corrosion, aluminum, and steel, and damage to vehicles, bridges, roads, and buildings. Excessive salt pollutes the environment. It can negatively affect pets, wildlife, plants and shrubs, and streams and rivers. The increase of salt in surface water results in the disruption of stream ecosystems, including fish kills. The drinking water supply of Montgomery County is showing a steady increase in the amounts of sodium and chloride in the treated water. The drinking water treatment process does not remove salt from the drinking water, and the treatment processes needed to remove salt, such as reverse osmosis, are extremely expensive to implement on a large scale. WSSC Water has, has provided a letter which details the effects of salt on the drinking water treatment process. The county supports the exclusion of state and local governments from the definition of commercial applicators, as they are required to provide salt application training for their employees and contractors under their municipal separate storm source system, MS4 permit. This bill is an important step forward in protecting the county's infrastructure, environment, and drinking water from the negative impacts of salt use. I respectfully request the Environmental and Transportation Committee give this bill a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Next, let's uh, turn to Carl Van Nest. Uh, Carl, welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, Chairman Barve. Um, thank you for giving me time to speak. Um, my name is Carl Van Nest. I'm Vice President of the Mud Branch Alliance from Montgomery County, Maryland. And we're hoping for a favorable, favorable report on this bill. So 
since 2019, the Muddy Branch Alliance has been monitoring the Muddy Branch and the Watts Branch streams. Our streams have had toxic levels of salt in them for over one third of the year. Proper training of private salt distributors is a key to reducing the amount of salt we use. It is somewhat, um, salt is somewhat effective on ice. So following a major snow event, we need to continue to use it on major roads, emergency routes, and dangerous intersections. But unfortunately, because salt is literally dirt cheap, it costs $58 per ton, it's used everywhere. So again, the, the true cost of salt is much greater than the $58 per ton. It gets in our water supply. It's harmful to people with high blood pressure and kidney disease. It kills our vegetation and stream and animal life. It corrodes our bridges. We just saw a bridge collapse in Pittsburgh. It corrodes our pipes. We've had numerous pipes burst in Maryland, Flint, Michigan, um, uh, and places like that. And it corrodes our roads and cars. Really, the best place for salt is on my stake. We need to use salt smartly to limit the harmful side effects, and this bill will help. Management 101 tells us that we need to track salt usage. The State Highway Administration doesn't know how much salt is used throughout the state. This bill will help. Management 101 tells us we need to effectively train people. The SHA doesn't know who or when people have been trained, and it doesn't have Spanish training materials. This bill will help. Management 101 tells us that we should limit salt use near watersheds that are already impaired. The SHA doesn't know, doesn't share impaired stream locations with contractors. This will help. It's obvious that the SHA training hasn't been impactful, and we see the remnants of salt use everywhere after a storm. This bill will help make training impactful. Unmanaged salt is dangerous. We can't throw it everywhere. We must manage it, and this bill will help. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, next, let's uh, turn to Mary Kay Smith. Um, uh, Ms. Smith, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Thank you. I'm Mary Kay Smith, president of the Seneca Creek Watershed Partners. Our watershed encompasses about one third of Montgomery County. I'm in favor of this bill to require salt distributor training. Although salt is cheap and convenient, as we've just heard, um, there are significant non-monetary costs to salt. Training private contractors who do salt applications will reduce excess use of salt. Salt corrodes bridges, pipes, cars, and roads, leading to expensive repairs. But more importantly, the greatest cost of salt is its negative impact on our waterways. Salt on roads is washed by rain into streams, sometimes at rates so high it damages or kills vegetation and wildlife. Once the salt enters streams, it eventually becomes part of the water we drink. I have hypertension, a medical condition made much worse when I consume salt. An estimated 1.5 million adult Maryland residents have hypertension. That's according to the 2015 Maryland Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. Because of excessive road salt, each of us with hypertension living in the Maryland unknowingly end up drinking water that is salty. I have also served on the board of the Muddy Branch Alliance, which has been doing salt monitoring. Muddy Branch is a tributary of the Potomac River. Chloride levels in this stream are extremely high. Carl Van Ness, who you just heard from, leads the salt monitoring effort at Muddy Branch. I've taken samples from Seneca Creek, which were also high for salt, though less high than Muddy Branch. In the future, we hope to have volunteers sample and determine the salt levels for Seneca Creek over time in and in various locations. We have not yet been able to do that. Proper training and statewide monitoring of salt are important steps to reduce salt in our waterways. We need to know how much salt we are distributing. We see excessive amounts of salt on our roads, piled up at intersections and along curbsides and in um, private parking lots. To be fair, many private contractors do a good job, but yeah, others are less careful. If you could begin to wrap up your testimony. Sure. Appreciate it. Proper training will help contractors know how much is required to create safe conditions and how to apply uh, without having excess salt, which creates a different kind of danger, danger to our environment and to our human health. Thank you very much. I hope you will vote in favor of HB 0371. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn to the one witness who's signed up in opposition to, uh, to testify. 
Oh, no, there are a couple of people who are signed up to testify. Uh, I, I'm going to go through the opponents and then we'll proceed to questions. Uh, the first opponent is Lewis Campion. Lewis, welcome back to the committee. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Lewis Campion with Maryland Motor Truck Association. And I am not here to argue that training in this area is necessary or you know, that I don't appreciate the interest in reducing salt, salt runoff. We're just opposed to this legislation because we think there's a better approach to this that's already in existence in the state of New Hampshire, which is a voluntary incentive driven approach um, where they are putting uh, commercial applicators through similar training. I and mean, we did have a chance to preview actually a summary of this legislation last fall. And at that time, it was originally drafted as a voluntary program modeled after the state of New Hampshire, but then what was ultimately introduced was a mandate. So we just think a carrot approach is maybe a little bit better than a stick approach. Let me just be clear about the language in this bill, if I might. As it's drafted, it requires all businesses of all sizes who apply any salt to their sidewalks, parking lots, or roads to participate in this new program. There's no qualifier based on minimum quantities. It just says that you're, it's businesses. Any business that puts out salt is subject to this program. It mandates the payment of an unspecified fee, record keeping of every SALT application for three years, and submission of an annual report to the Department of the Environment. So what we're suggesting is just that in lieu of this mandate, that we should look at the New Hampshire program. And what has happened in New Hampshire is you complete this voluntary certification program, SALT applicators and the property managers who hire them, for example, they get limited liability protection against damages from lawsuits that involve things like slips, trips, and falls, as long as they weren't grossly negligent in how they cared for their property. They have over 500 people listed who have gone through that training organizations and the like, and the fees range from $25 to $350. We know MDE is developing a similar training, and we want to encourage people to use that training. We're just suggesting that that is a model that the state should consider in lieu of some of the unspecified mandates that are in this bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next, let's hear from Edward Harrison. Edward, uh, welcome back. You have two minutes. Is Edward Harrison in the house? No. I believe he's, I believe he's working on unmuting at the moment. There you go. Here okay, I am. All right. There we are. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Good, after, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of this committee. My name is Eddie Harrison. I'm here ex to express my personal opinion and my opinion alone, not here for any reference rep to represent any group or entity that I may be affiliated with. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you regarding this piece of legislation. I am opposed to Bill HB 371. I've been pushing snow for most of my life. When I started my construction business in 1993, I, hire out, I hired out myself and my equipment to push snow in parking lots. The following year, I obtained a snow contract with Carroll County. Um, after a few years, I obtained a state highway contract. As my business grew, I added multiple trucks on the state highway and hired out my excavation equipment for parking lots and snow and snow removal. I ended my contract plowing snow a few years ago to spend more of my energy on my current venture. Salt contamination of wells and waterways have been a concern of mine for many years. The well issue shows up in the on-site wastewater industry operation and maintenance, treatment systems to mitigate salinity in well water overload and on-site wastewater systems. You don't, you don't see contaminated wells alongside of parking lots. You see them alongside of public roadways. While fulfilling my contractual duties, I have seen the overuse of salt. After training courses and truck calibrations, when the snow starts to really fall, we would be instructed to make the roads black. After the last winter event we had a couple of weeks ago, where OC got 12 inches and Frederick County got a drizzly rain, the highways in Frederick County were white with salt. The parking lots in and around my neighborhood were black with very little salt left on. This is not a criticism of county or state. It's a systematic issue. I feel like um, that that the um, th there's a there's a cultural thing here. You know, people people want their roads black. They want their they want they don't want to they don't want an unsafe road. And 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 when my thinking is. 
people should be, it's going to be hard work, but to train people to stay home while it's snowing. And then, and then, cause it's that way the trucks don't have to be constantly spreading this, that drizzly rain we had went on for 20 hours and the trucks just kept going by spreading a little more, spreading a little more, nothing ever froze to the ground. Um, so, uh, you know, thank uh, you. your two minutes are up, but I have to say, are, are you for or against this bill? I'm against this bill. I'm against this bill. I'm not, I'm not against, um, uh, that we should control the salt. I'm absolutely against it. I'm trying to say that the private contractor is a very, very minute part of the problem. Oh, okay. All right. The biggest okay. part of the problem is... is okay. I, I just wanted to... That's good. I just wanted to make sure you didn't sign up the wrong way. No. Um, okay. Next, we'll hear from Jim uh, McWilliams. Jim, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes, sir. Is Jim McWilliams with us? Okay, it appears Jim McWilliams is not with us. So we're gonna to proceed to questions. Uh, first question goes to Delegate uh, Foley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you to my um, District 15 teammate, Delegate Chi for bringing this bill forward. Um, Delegate Chi, my question is for you. Um, how difficult will it be? Uh, you mentioned that uh, MDE is already working on this. So how difficult will it be for um, MDE to set up this program? Thank you for the question. Um, as I mentioned, we uh, have reached out to MDE and had a multiple conversations. So they are well prepared for that. Um, they have provided an informational testimony. Um, this has precedent. Uh, they are already doing the same thing with public contractors, so they can just model after that. I understand last year they already uh, identified a contractor to develop the curriculum, so it should not be you know, uh, a, a tremendous overhead. But we recently checked in with them. For some reason, it has not completed. Um, so we said, okay, we can be uh, lenient on the implementation time to make sure they can set up properly. Thank yes, you. And, and just, uh, Delegate Chi, just to remind me, what is the implementation time, 2024? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. It's Jim McWilliams. I am here. Um, okay. Mr. You've got you've got exactly two minutes, and then we'll Thank you. do questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Jim McWilliams. Williams. I am president of the Maryland Green Industry Council, and I'm a small business owner in Towson, just south of Towson University called Maxelia Landscape. The green industry is opposed to House Bill 371. The following issues will confirm why this program is not good for commercial businesses. Every snow and ice storm or event, as we call them, is different. The amount of salt applied increases the risk of liability for our clients and our customers should someone slip or fall on a site. Freezing rain events can last for long periods of time, so there is a need for continuous salt or de-icing materials to be applied. There are no agreed upon manufactured standards, unlike for pesticides or fertilizer, for use of, the salt, of salt or de-icing products. In a lab, you know exactly how much salt is needed to achieve an intended result. However, a snowstorm or, or salt event, this type of situation does not exist. The nature of the precipitation, the temperature, the type of, of surface, asphalt, pavers, concrete has no standard for how much salt or de-icing products will be needed to consider a site safe to walk on or drive on. These varying factors and scenarios would make enforcement very difficult, if not impossible. It does seem odd that the bill does target commercial businesses and that the biggest users, as the previous speaker said, of salt and de-icing materials as state and local government agencies. Take a look around before a snow event, after a snow event, during the event, you will see dust clouds and white powder pavement everywhere and the salt residue on our highways and primary and even secondary streets. Why would they not be included in this bill? When I testified against Senate Bill 246 last week, one of the proponents of that bill stated, commercial businesses need to do the right thing. With all due respect, that is insulting that one would think commercial businesses don't train their employees on proper application of de-icing products. Okay, the members yeah, of the Green Industry Council, up. the members of the Green Industry Council would like to have an unfavorable report for House Bill 371. Thank you for your time. 
Okay, let's proceed with questions. The next question goes to Delegate Lehman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you, Delegate Chi, for bringing this bill. I, it's funny, I, as I've walked around Annapolis the last several weeks since we've had several winter weather events, I have been thinking about all of this salt I'm seeing on our roadways um, and there is, and, and sidewalks, and there is a lot, a lot of it. Um, I wonder if you have any idea, um, and if you don't, if you could follow up on what to, to, to the point that the gentleman just made about um, uh, state and local government applications of, of SALT versus private contractors. What roughly do you know does that breakdown look like? Because my impression is with, um, well, having been on the county council in Prince George just for eight years, that local and, and county governments do contract, um, you know, some more than others with private contractors and don't, don't, some jurisdictions don't even have their own fleets of, of trucks and other, you know, and plows and other um, equipment um, that, that are spreading de-icing material. So what, do you know what that breakdown is like? Um, I can get you the breakdown number, but I can respond to your general concern. Uh, which is about those contractors that work with the uh, counties, new municipalities, and the state. Uh, they are already required. So to respond to Mr. Uh, Jim McWilliams, it is not true that we only target private vendors because there is already requirement under MS4 um, permitting for any you know, state, county, municipal contractors to comply with the Smart Salt program. There is a void to be filled for the rest of the contractors. That's why this bill is necessary. So we're not carving out public contractors just to clarify the record, okay? Right, and, that, and that's, that. thank you, Delegate Chi. That's why I raised that question because it, it, this standard is, I figured that was the answer that the, this standard is being, um, you know, uh, used for private contractors if they had work with with government. state and local government. Yeah. Um, and and so I, I do appreciate that. The second question really quickly is in, in you know, researching this legislation and talking to the state, um, is the state or, or any localities, um, have they seriously looked at de-icing products that are alternatives to salt that, that don't have, you know, the negative um, effects that salt have, especially on the, well, the environment and human health? Yeah, that's another great question. I believe uh, different uh, communities, jurisdictions, and states are exploring that. It's a matter of cost. Um, you know, salt is probably the cheapest, the easiest, the most, most available product. Um, but I believe over time, you know, I, I have faith in uh, the commercial world catching up with what's right for humanity in general, uh, um, producing innovative products that could be affordable. But as, as of now, it's salt or some very limited choices that probably are not as cheap uh, from my understanding. Right. But there have been a, a lot of studies recently on this issue and even suggestions of some chemical products that can also do the same trick. Great. I hope we see some innovation on that front. And thank you for bringing this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, before I recognize Delegate Amprey, let me just follow up on Delegate Lehman's question. Uh, Delegate Chi, if the MS4 permits already per require local governments to comply with these regulations, why would they object to being included if they're already doing it? I mean, is, is your requirement stricter than the MS4 permit requirements? No, it's not stricter. It's modeled after that. Well, then we should just include them. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, Delegate Amprey has the next question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and, and uh, my question is, is for the sponsor. And, you know, this, this is one of those issues that hits home, right? Because I literally hit a massive pothole the other day that I know was a product of a lot of salt. And uh, I'm hoping that my, my car is going to be okay. Um, but uh, my question is, is more so along the, uh, the the fees that would be imposed on these companies. What would that be? Um, and then the, the second question I have is just general, um, how how would this be enforced? Uh, you know, when, when you think about like a snowstorm, you know, the only people out there are the trucks <laughs> putting down the salt. So just thinking about the enforcement of this rule, like what, what would it look like? How would it actually uh, work? Yeah. Thank you very much. These are great questions. Uh, so to your first question, it's up to MBE, MDE, uh, if they want to just, you know, recoup the 
the, the cost, uh, the overhead cost of administering the program, they could charge no fee or very nominal fee um, for the, let's say a couple of hours of training, right? For example, uh, currently the public contractors pay no fee as part of their contracting with the government. Um, so we certainly hope that could be the baseline uh, to make it not cost prohibitive to participate. But as far as enforcement is concerned, my uh, argument is uh, uh, let's think about how the state enforces anything. You know, it's never a perfect scheme. You, you never have enough state resources to go after every business to check on them. But you, you can, you know, develop a plan to check on certain as a, as a sample size, for example, right? Uh, to see how widely uh, uh, applied that there is. And, you know, we are here to legislate every year. If this is not as reasonable as we think it is, we can change. Uh, but the spirit is to spread awareness, promote efficient use of salt, um, and to collect the data. Uh, that's an important part of it, you know. And, and if I can have one more bite at the apple, Mr. Chair, I have really one quick question. Sure. One question. Um, and this question can go to the sponsor or anyone. Is there any data on whenever you impose these kind of programs um, in which uh, uh, contractors are required to use less salt or figure out how to be more efficient with their salt, do we have any data on how much money they save? Is there any economic benefit to these companies now using this like better practices? Is there any data on that? Uh, we could probably look into that. Um, I cannot uh, speak off top of my mind, but yes, it will be cost saving for businesses to use, use less salt. Uh, as cheap as it might be, it still costs, you know, if you use tons and tons of them. Okay, next question goes to Delegate uh, Weivel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think my question has been answered, but just to clarify with the bill sponsor. So you said that state and county governments already have to comply with this. So are you saying that all the drivers in state and county government already undertake this training program? They are supposed to, either they're employers or they are supposed to uh, comply with the Smart Salt program through their uh, permit process. Yeah, state, county, and municipalities. All right, thank you. Sure. Okay, next question goes to Delegate Silberti. Barry? Barry, are you- uh... Sorry, we okay. Okay, you're- Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Okay. It's always difficult to follow the incisive and erudite uh, Delegate Weibel, but I should try. We have a um, situation, well, I, I guess most kitchens do. They have these faucets and they have the filters on them. So the point is, in terms of a question, does that filter impact positively enough on the removal of the salt, yes or no? I don't think the filter can filter out salt easily. Uh, even WSSC with its sophistication in uh, removing a lot of the undesirable chemicals cannot easily remove salt. Uh, in our drinking water. It's getting saltier in, in recent years. Irrespective of the filter. Um, I don't believe that the filter can do the trick from yeah. what I read. A, a simple carbon filter on your faucet will not remove the salt. If you have a reverse osmosis system on your at your house, that would remove the salt. Remove reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis. Osmosis, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Sorry about that. Nope, that's fine. Uh, next question goes to Delegate Healy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank uh, Delegate Chief for this bill uh, and this discussion. And I'd like to follow up on Delegate Layman's question, but I would like to ask it of uh, Mr. McWilliams from Green Industries, from the industry's perspective, um, uh, the availability and uh, and the prospect in the future of, do, of being able to access products that are not salt-based. Can you uh, elaborate on that? Is there a possibility that we're in a transition period and, and this can be taken care of in the future, near future? I know we use magnesium as well as salt and the magnesium would be used on where there's concrete surfaces to avoid it to, you know, from flaking and chipping, which the salt would do that. Um, I am not currently aware of any other products that are on the market. And I don't know what's in the brine product that the, the state puts down on the highways ahead of time, but I can look into that and let you know. I would appreciate that. I, I've heard, you know, things about using 
some kind of sugar-based kind of operation. I, I mean, I've read broadly about it, but I thought maybe in the industry, you might be aware of other products that are just coming onto the market. At the moment, I'm not, but I will definitely look into that for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, um, okay, next question goes to Delegate Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Delegate Chief, for uh, having this bill today. Uh, a couple uh, quick questions. Uh, one, you're saying that uh, the salt is uh, getting prevalent in our drinking water. Is that, is the prevalence of the salt in our drinking water mainly from water that comes from reservoirs or is it coming from uh, water systems where there's deep water wells, say in the rural areas where we live off of uh, you know, a well? Uh, are you saying that the salt has penetrated down to the aquifer? Uh, thank, the, you for the the qu thank you for the question. Um, I cannot tell you exactly how much uh, is attributable to what, but I know excess road salt is a contributor, uh, is a significant contributor. I actually would like to defer to Mr. Schofer if he has any comment on that because he's much more of a technical expert on this than me. Yeah, I think the answer is both. I mean, salt gets into the Potomac River. It, it, it gets into reservoirs less because they're contained, but it gets into the reservoirs and uh, there is saltwater intrusion and groundwater wells, especially the ones that are near roads. Now, would that be deep water wells or, or shallow wells? I'm not sure. Not I, sure. I, I know it affects okay. wells, but I'm not, I don't really understand or know the dynamics okay. of it. Okay. Um, the next question is your comment that, uh, sort of delegate, your comment that it, they could actually save the uh, contractors that contract to push snow and spread salt for the county, save them money because of the cost, even though it's limited of the salt. Uh, I, I'm not sure that plays out correctly because if less I'm mistaken, at least down here in Southern Maryland, uh, the county supply the salt and the salt is loaded onto the contractor's truck at the county owned salt domes. Yeah. So, uh, I, my question would be this, uh, wouldn't this actually increase the cost of the snow removal by having to certify the driver? And once you certified the driver, the driver would be in a position where you would need to pay more to be able to go out and do that. So actually, I don't think it would be a cost savings. It would be more of a incurred cost to, to uh, actually operate that system. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad or either way, but I, I just don't think there's any cost savings there for a contractor. I believe, uh, if anything, it would cost him more. So therefore, it would cost local government more. Okay. You, well, you, could you, could I respond to that? Okay. Sure. Uh, so to your first point, when I say cost savings, I mean private contractors. So when you say county government provides free salt, I'm talking about private contractors don't contract with county governments or any governments. Mm -hmm. They contract with churches, schools, targets and Walmarts, those commercial parking lots, building uh, of property owners, those kind of contractors, okay? First of all, so they have to pay for their own salt. So with much more efficient salt application, they can save some cost in buying salt. Um, so the, the, uh, I'm sorry, what was your second? Oh, you, you're talking about the, the cost of the certification training. Um, yeah. It could be no cost. So it, it depends on how much MDE. MDE cannot cite us a, a number yet, uh, but it will be nominal and it could be free. It could be very nominal. Um, so we don't know. Uh, you cannot necessarily reach a conclusion that because there is such an expectation, it necessarily will be cost prohibitive. It could be nothing, you know. Um, so I, I don't necessarily agree that this could be a barrier for doing business. But uh, if, uh, my question to you would be back then, um, if you think there would be no cost uh, to, uh, to the certification, the employee or the, the truck driver who has to be a certified uh, truck driver with a proper uh, Department of Motor Vehicles license, would they have that certification? That's worth more to them. So therefore, they would demand a higher wage for having gone and become certified every three years 
to go out there and, and push the snow for the contractor that they work for. So well, uh, which, they, interesting... which they would be entitled to because they've increased their knowledge on uh, something that is regulated by the state that ultimately they could be, you know, possibly fined for or, or reprimanded for spreading too much salt. Um, I really don't have an answer to that hypothetical scenario. Uh, all kinds of things. To well, that, that's not hypothetical. That That's yeah. the way the world works. You get paid these days for what you know, not necessarily how hard you work. So oh, I it's think always, you. it's always been that way. <laughs> no, <laughs> my 40 years don't believe that. <laughs> I don't know. I know a lot of stuff, but I'm lazy as hell. So I don't know. <laughs> you see, I, I didn't know anything, but I don't mind working. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are, are you good? But, but in the Jerry? end, don't we want smarter um, distributors? I think that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> um, are you done, Jerry? Because yes. I've got Doug uh, Jacobs next. Uh, Jay, you're up. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Delegate Chi, I got a question about uh, how the how the uh, uh, education is applied. Um, so, does every employee say you had a, a company, a private company that had several employees? Does every employee have to take do the certification, or can a supervisor do the training and then uh, pass that on to the employees? That's an excellent question. Um, we actually intend for MDE to work it out. They can decide, they can develop regs, they can decide if it's adequate for one um, you know, master applicator, for example, to train a bunch of other employees within the same company or um, uh, whatever is reasonable, um, but we are not stipulating that in this uh, bill. Mr. Chairman, can I um, just uh, mention in New Hampshire, that is actually how the program operates. Sure. The delegate chief, so okay. they do. They do have different levels of certification that allow you to have a master trainer, and then the per employee fee is substantially lower than the master applicator fee sure. uh, or the exactly. master trainer yep. fee. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any further questions? Uh, okay, uh, seeing no further questions, thank you to one and all that ends the public hearing on that bill. Let's proceed to okay. House Bill 387, Delegate Ruth. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, I'm Delegate Sheila Ruth presenting House Bill 387. Uh, I don't think I'll need the full four minutes. I have a great panel of experts and my job is just to frame the bill and then get out of the way so you can listen to them. HB 387 transfers the authority, responsibility, funding, resources, and staff for pesticide regulation from agriculture to um, MDE and authorizes MDE in collaboration with MDA and the Department of Health to adopt regulations um, relating to pesticides up to and including establishing restricted uses or prohibitions. It also repeals the prohibition that states we should keep our regulations uniform with the federal and other state re requirements. Um, Maryland should have the right to protect our people and environment from chemicals we deem to be threats regardless of what the federal government does. In recent years, this committee has worked on bills restricting specific pesticides, including restrictions on neonics and chlorpyrifos. There are 14,000 pesticides registered with the EPA, and we cannot play legislative whack-a-mole with every one as new research expands our understanding of the consequences of these chemicals. We need a better way. We need systemic change to protect Marylanders' health and Maryland's environment. You will hear from environmental and health experts about the harm that pesticides can cause. You will hear why the Department of Environment is the best agency to oversee pesticide regulation. And you will hear about laws in other states where the environmental agency is the lead agency in regulating pesticides, including New York, which transferred the authority from their agriculture to environmental agency. Finally, I'd like to note that you will hear from some of the opponents about certain details of various programs that might be impacted. If there are details in this bill that need work or areas with unintended consequences, I'm happy to work with all the stakeholders to fix problems. 
but the concept is sound. Environment is the agency best equipped to look at pesticides holistically with agriculture and health implications considered in consultation with those agencies. And with that, I turn it over to the experts and ask for a favorable report on HB 387. Okay, uh, first witness up is Eric Galley. Eric, welcome back to the committee. You have two minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, my name is Eric Galley. I'm here today on behalf of the Smart on Pesticides Coalition. Well, so far today, you've heard bills about septics, mold, salt, and now pesticides. So I wonder what the next three plagues are going to be talking about here today. Uh, I'm sure we're going to add to that fun. Well, as Delegate Ruth said last year after the multi-year battle over chlorpyrifos ended, we sat down and decided that rather than come to you guys on a pesticide by pesticide basis, which I think you all are a bit tired of as well, that we would try to find a more systematic approach to protecting the environment and public health from these chemicals. This bill was one of the proposals that came out of the thought process. We had discussions with several members of the committee about them, and we decided to lead off with this one. MDE is the agency charged with broad oversight of the environment and the public health, and we're really just trying to change the lens over which pesticides are viewed. They're not just a chemical that grows crops and, and, and plants and, and yields food as well. They're also a chemical that has broad impact on the environment and public health. Also, pesticides are not just used in agriculture, they're used everywhere. Golf courses, parks, playgrounds, schools, government buildings, and our neighborhoods where we all live. There's a lot of spraying of these pesticides all over the place. They're used in heavy doses. They have deep impact on human health and the Chesapeake Bay, as well as our local rivers and streams. We just feel like they need to be evaluated and when necessary, regulated by the agency that is broadly in charge of protecting the environment and human health. MDE is that agency. You're gonna hear about the several other states that have taken this holistic approach. They're not the only states that may do this. We, were, we haven't been able to scope all 50 of the states in the short period of time we've been working on this bill. We were led by national folks to these examples. And we verify- Eric, if you examples. could wind it up, we have a lot of witnesses testifying. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Sorry to run over my time. We urge a favorable report and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, Anna Rule. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Finding the unmute button is always tricky. My name is Anna Rule, and I am testifying also on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Quiroz Alcala. We're assistant professors at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health with exper expertise in exposure science and environmental epidemiology. And we support passage of HB 387. As scientists focus on environmental exposures among vulnerable populations, we have concerns as how, to, how the state regulates pesticides that can have adverse health effects. Today, MDE, MDA has not prioritized public health when managing registration of pesticides or supporting pesticide restriction legislation. One thing that I'd like to highlight is that pesticides encompass a wide range of harmful chemicals, including disinfectants, whose use has dramatically increased during the COVID-19 pandemic. This has led to an increased pesticide exposure burden on workers and the population at large. Most disinfectants are registered pesticides that can directly weaken the immune system and respiratory health, especially for those with pre-existing conditions like asthma. A particular concern is the rising widespread use of disinfectants in homes, schools, daycare centers, and other public locations. Children in particular spend more than 90% of their time indoors where these disinfectants and other pesticides may be applied and persist. Exposure to pesticides during pregnancy is another concern and is associated with increased risk of mental and behavioral problems in children. This is concerning because on average, it costs twice as much to educate, educate a child with learning disabilities compared to costs associated with educating children without disabilities. SB 387 is an urgently needed bill uh, and public health solution 
as MDE is uniquely qualified to oversee regulation of all hazardous pesticides. This committee has the opportunity to truly protect the health of our citizens, including the most vulnerable, with a favorable report on HB 387. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, uh, let's next turn to Mike uh, Itchen. Ichinowski, I hope I got your name correct. Ichinowski, it's, it's I've heard I've heard lots of ways. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. No, no worries, no worries. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I'm Dr. Michael Ichinowski, representing the Maryland chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and Maryland MedCi, and I'm testifying on behalf of Maryland's children whose health and well-being need to be considered and be a priority when considering pesticide use. Children are uniquely susceptible to the toxic effects of pesticides, particularly during the prenatal period and early childhood when critical brain and organ development occur. Pesticide exposures have been linked to childhood cancers, developmental delays, lower IQ, autism and ADHD, endocrine disruption, preterm birth and low birth weight. The American Academy of Pediatrics has recommended that children's exposures to pesticides should be limited as much as possible. Children living on and near farms are exposed to agricultural pesticides, which also leave residues on the foods children eat and enter water supplies through drift and runoff. Children are also exposed to pesticides in non-agricultural settings like recreational fields, public parks and golf courses, as well as schools, daycare centers and hospitals. The Department of Agriculture currently oversees these non-agricultural uses of pesticides and is also responsible for implementing and enforcing Maryland's integrated pest management in schools law which Maryland AAP had also supported. MDA's initial guidance on this law erroneously described IPM as an alternative to pesticide use in school rather than the mandated method of pest control. MDA listed pesticides as an important part of IPM rather than the alternative of last resort to be used only after all the measures had failed. MDA had also stated that notifying parents and staff of pesticide applications in school was voluntary rather than mandatory. House Bill 387 would transfer these responsibilities for IPM and pesticide regulation to the Department of Environment with input from the Departments of Health and Agriculture. This arrangement would allow for consideration of children's health as well as public and environmental health whenever pesticides are used. This transfer of regulatory oversight would allow for a more thorough evaluation of pesticides prior to approval and minimize the need for Maryland legislators to have to consider these chemicals on a case-by-case -case basis. Maryland AAP and MedCi respectfully request a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, Christy uh, Truesdale. Christy, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Is Christy there? Well, we'll move on. Um, how about Gwen Dubois? Hi, my name is Dr. Gwen Dubois. I'm president of Chesapeake Physicians for Social Responsibility, CPSR. It's a statewide evidence-based organization of 940 physicians, other health professionals, and supporters. We know that prevention is far superior to treatment in reducing costs, death, illness, injury, and suffering. The list of pesticide-associated conditions are extensive and include congenital birth defects, premature labor, diabetes, asthma, chronic lung disease, hypertension, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and a long list of cancers including childhood leukemia and brain cancer in children. Pesticide exposures impact all people, but especially vulnerable populations like children and the elderly, and those most heavily exposed, like agricultural workers and farm communities. Pesticides get into groundwater and drinking water. Five or more pesticides were found in nearly every sample from 72 streams across this country. Pesticides are found in human breast milk. In a study in Iowa, glyphosate, a probable carcinogen and the most commonly used pesticide in Maryland, was detectable in the urine of 65% of non-farming mothers and 88% of non-farming children. Pesticides are everywhere in our environment, and that is why CPSR believes the Department of Environment, in consultation with the Health Department, Department of Agriculture, should regulate this increasingly complex landscape of toxins. They can assess the appropriateness of using pesticide close to the time of harvesting, like Roundup, and combining two herbicides linked to cancer, like Duo. Weighing, they have to weigh risks related to health and environment versus the benefits to farmers who use them and companies that produce them. Chesapeake PSR supports HB 387. The Department of Environment, properly funded and staffed, is best suited to regulate pesticides in a way that benefits all the stakeholders, that protects the environment, the water we drink, the food that we eat, farming and non-farming communities alike. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's next go to Katie Huffling. Katie? Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. 
I'm Dr. Katie Huffling, and I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. I'm also a nurse and certified nurse midwife. The Alliance is the only national nursing organization whose main focus is on the intersection of health and the environment. We strongly support HB 387. This, as you've just heard, pesticides have a wide range of negative health impacts, which include impacts on the nervous system, some are carcinogens, while others affect the hormone and endocrine system. As highlighted by research by the CDC, pesticide exposures are leading to increasing body burdens of these chemicals. What this means is that people of all ages, including newborn babies at the time of their birth, are found to have pesticides and other potentially hazardous chemicals circulating in their blood. In 2021, the US Environmental Protection Agency finally banned chlorpyrifos on all food crops after several states, including Maryland, restricted or banned this brain harming pesticide as it was found to be impacting the developing fetus and young children at any detectable level. This decision was based on the EPA's own 20 plus years of research and in response to lawsuits including from several states, including Maryland, as well as pressure from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals demanding that the EPA make a final determination on chlorpyrifos. While EPA has made strides since its inception, it is slow to adequately address major pesticide-related public health issues, as highlighted by the example of chlorpyrifos. Here in Maryland, we can do better. Oversight of pesticides needs to take human health impacts into account, which is the charge of Maryland Department of the Environment. The Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments asks you to please give a favorable report on HB 387. Thank you. Thank you. Let's next go to Luke Gomble. Luke, uh, welcome back to the committee. Luke, I saw you out there. I had problem unmuting there. Uh, okay. I'm a PhD chemist who's worked for the Army, NASA, and Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. I'm also a beekeeper who serves on the board of the Central Maryland Beekeepers Association. The EPA registers pesticides based on an analysis which can sometimes discount science on pesticides' effect on man and nature. Federal law allows states to regulate the sale or use of any registered pesticide within the state. Maryland can and must perform their own risk-benefit assessment based on current science. A risk-benefit analysis must consider pesticides' role in the loss of about half of beekeepers' hives every year compared to 10% losses in past decades, the nearly 50-fold increase in the toxicity of the environment to bees in the last 30 years, a 30% reduction in bird population in the last 50 years, and the 75% reduction in the biomass of flying insects over three decades. MDA opposed the 2016 Pollinator Protection Act, despite overwhelming evidence linking pollinator losses to pesticide exposure. After the act became law, MDA used a loophole to allow the sale of these banned products to consumers. 350 beekeepers signed on to testimony to eliminate the loophole last year, and we thank this committee and the MGA for correcting this. These facts show the need for properly staffed MDE oversight on pesticides. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, let's hear from Robin Todd. Uh, Robin, uh, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Is Robin Todd? Okay. Robin Todd. Yes, yes, I am. Uh, okay. Um, it's Robin okay. Todd. Hi, sorry. Um, my name is Robin Todd. I'm a retired entomologist, and I'm um, speaking on behalf of the Maryland Ornithological Society, which is an 1,800-member strong um, organization based in Maryland, which is devoted to the preservation, study, and enjoyment of birds and their habitats. Now, probably most of you are aware of the damage that pesticides have and can do to birds. Witness the... Um, the crashing loss and populations of the uh, bald eagle and brown pelican, all three species which have recovered since the banning of DDT and are now out from under the Endangered Species Act. 
Um, a 2020 study documented that increased uses of neonicotinoid insecticides in the US led to statistically significant reductions in bird populations between 2008 and 2014, when the use of these insecticides increased. 4% uh, per year of field birds lost, 3% per year of insectivorous birds lost. A 2016 EPA evaluation of endangered species found that chlorpyrifos uh, was adversely affecting 97% of taxa, including 93 out of 110 bird species. Uh, one of my colleagues, my previous colleague, has already mentioned the shocking loss of a third of our birds in the 1970s. But birds also provide economic benefits to Maryland. 900 residents and non-residents enjoy birding in the state, and Maryland has generated 483 million from wildlife watching activities in 2011, with a total industrial output of over 909 million, the creation of 11, almost 11,000 part-time and full-time jobs and for 800, excuse me, 88.4 million in tax revenues. In closing, I'd like to point out that birds provide valuable ecological services in pest control, seed dispersal, and pollination. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and I must, uh, before I recognize Adam Ballack, I must compliment the uh, advocacy uh, um, panel for all staying within two minutes. This may be on now, a new world record. Well, not a world record, but an ENT e record. So with that, let me recognize uh, Adam Balick or Balick. Yeah, Balick, <laughs> thanks. Um, my name is Adam Balick and I represent the University of Maryland Environmental Law Clinic, uh, testifying on our legal research regarding regulation of pesticides at the state level attached to our testimony. Although state pesticide regulatory authority is usually instituted by the state's Department of Agriculture, our research focuses on six states that exemplify how this decision is not a universal standard. All state pesticide laws must comply with FIFRA requirements, the federal statute that governs the registration, distribution, sale, and use of pesticides in the U.S. However, FIFRA affords flexibility to states in their regulation of pesticides, allowing more stringent requirements than FIFRA dictates deemed necessary to protect the interests of the state. Our detailed report provides data on states that for health and safety evaluation or for consolidation and efficiency have elected to give a state agency outside of agriculture regulatory power over pesticides. These states are New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Alaska, Rhode Island, South Carolina. Uh, New York transitioned pesticide regulation authority from their Department of Agriculture with that department's recommendation to the Department of Environmental Conservation to quote, improve and coordinate the environmental plans, functions, powers, and programs of the state. New Jersey's Department of Environmental Protection is responsible for regulating its integrated pest management, or IPM, in schools and has added many restrictions unique to the state. New Jersey has 381 state restricted pesticides on their 2022 restricted use pesticide registration list. They consider acute neurocarcinogen and reproductive toxicity and other health effects along with environmental fate. Rhode Island's Department of Environmental Management assesses if pesticides are highly toxic to humans. Given consideration to findings and recommendations of other agencies, the federal government, or other reliable sources, and monitors pesticides throughout the state, including pesticides found in fresh and salt waters, soils, and crops intended for human consumption. Results of this program are viewed at least annually by their Pesticide Relief Advisory Board, which advises on least hazardous pest control and possible pesticide-related health hazards. Maryland would not be the first state to transfer authority over pesticide regulation to a department better suited to carry out regulatory duties. Happy to answer specific questions. Okay, thank you very much. Let's next go to Jason Davidson. Jason? Thank you, Chair and Barve, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jason Davidson. I am representing Friends of the Earth. Uh, at the federal level, as you've heard, EPA has taken nearly no actions to significantly restrict or ban the most egregious pesticides over the past decade and beyond, chlorpyrifos accepting. And EPA's pesticide registration process has allowed for loopholes, oversights, and institutionalized practices, leading to a dearth of protections from harmful chemicals. And as a result, attention has necessarily shifted to state legislation and regulation. Yet for the vast majority of pesticides, state regulators, such as the Maryland Department of Agriculture, rely heavily on EPA for registration decisions. Yet states whose pesticide registration authority lies under the Department of the Environment rather than agriculture have historically been more protective of people and pollinators, as you just heard. 
New York's Department of Environmental Conservation, for instance, has banned six pesticides or classes of pesticides that EPA has not and restricted many more while Maryland has done so for two pesticides. Most recently, New York banned chlorpyrifos prior to EPA and classified a number of neonicotinoid uses as restricted use. And it's a similar story in other places. So you heard some specifics on the various review structures. Um, and of course, places like New York, like the other states, uh, still consult very closely with their respective departments of agriculture and relevant farming communities. And ultimately pairing pesticide regulation with regulators whose primary mission it is to protect people and the environment from pollution can result in much better protections for people and pollinators from pesticides. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And before I uh, continue, uh, we're about to uh, go through all the proponents. I, you know, I find that with Zoom, it's much more practical to go through all the witnesses just after my experience with this. So I'm gonna do this again. I'm gonna go through all of the opponents as well, and then we're gonna get to questions. It's not something that I think we can continue to do when we have uh, public hearings, um, uh, in our committee room because not everybody can be present to hear everything, but they but you can now. So in any case, uh, next we're gonna hear from Derek Weston. Derek? Yes, you thank, you. thank you. My name is Derek Weston and I'm a board member of the Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake and we support HB 387. I manage a large community garden plot that provides hundreds of pounds of produce to food pantries all over Baltimore. I don't confuse what I do on a small urban plot with what farmers do. I can't imagine the, farm, the pressure that farmers feel feeding a whole region while trying to make a living. And to help farmers, the MDA has a commitment to promote profitable agriculture and consumer confidence. But there are times, however, when this core objective might be at odds with something which we are all called to do, which is protect human health and the environment. When those times occur, it is important that there is a body clearly dedicated to advocating for the people and the environment. More and more people of faith are waking up to our responsibility to be responsible stewards of the environment. That we are in right relationship with created world is not a side venture to our faith, but is a critical part of it. The pursuit of right relationship is fundamentally at the core of MDE's charge, protecting public health and the environment. Farmers are people like the rest of us and their families can also be harmed by highly toxic pesticides that can cause long-term impacts like cancer, autism, birth defects, and more. They too deserve to be protected by an agency that prioritizes their health and the use of pesticides on the farm. MDE has the scientific resources and experience necessary to monitor and reduce toxic pesticide exposure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go next to Gabriel Ross. Gabriel, um, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, my name is Gabby Ross. I'm the SD Coast Keeper testifying on behalf of SD Coastal Trust, the water keeper program for the Lower Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, HB 387 is vital for the citizens of the Lower Eastern Shore of Maryland, and we advise a favorable report. With increasing severity of rain events over the past few years, we've seen an increase of nutrients, pollutants, PFAS, and declines in important species in our coastal waterways from the runoff and over application of pesticides. For example, methoprene has been scientifically shown to have adverse impacts on blue crabs. While methoprene is used in MDA's mosquito control program to prevent mosquito larvae from maturing into an adult, it also prevents blue crab embryos from maturing into blue crabs, uh, adult blue crabs, um, as well as affecting the development of the crabs at all stages of life. I go into greater detail in my written testimony regarding the methoprene and blue crabs. Other pesticides accumulate in the tissue of blue crabs and remain there for a long time because it's very difficult to metabolize. This results in long health, uh, health impacts that may eventually lead to the death of blue crabs. Dr. Vicki Blazer at the USGS has done significant research on the harmful impacts of pesticides on Maryland's fish populations. Uh, in addition, watermen and aquaculture businesses are seeing a direct impact of their livelihoods. We are also seeing this in fish as well as bivalves. Not only does this affect watermen's income, but the health of the Marylanders who eat these species. Watermen have told us in the past that as they are pulling their pots down along the western shores of Chincoteague Bay, that they've had spray plants go up over top of them and deposit spray on them in the past on our coastal waterways. Over the years, we've seen the misuse, over-application and misrepresentation 
of how these pesticides affect the health of Maryland residents, its flora and fauna, and ultimately its impacts in the environment. The time to act is now. We urge a favorable report on HB 387. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Laura Stewart. Laura, welcome to the committee. You have two minutes. Thank you. And uh, I'm under pressure to keep the two minutes. So <laughs> good afternoon, Chairman Barbie and committee members. My name is Laura Stewart and I am representing our statewide PTA organization, Free State PTA, as VP for Advocacy and Montgomery County Council's PTA's Health and Wellness Committee. Our PTA is aligned with national PTA advocating for eliminating environmental pollutants and preventing new hazards protecting children by limiting exposure and addressing remedies and collecting data about environmental hazards and health risks. We believe that transferring the regulation of pesticides to the Department of Environment would provide expanded protection to our children when EPA registered pesticides are used in schools, especially those currently being used to control pathogens associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, in the school system's rush to disinfect our classrooms, known respiratory irritants were used regularly in the presence of children, and it took advocates working with school systems to ensure safer products were procured. Transparency, verification, and compliance with the Maryland School IPM law intended to specifically protect children and their school environment is necessary to ensure the measures taken meet current science-based guidance on safer air and water quality during pest management in schools. We believe an agency whose focus is protecting public health and our environment from known toxins would be better able to protect children from pesticides allowed for use in the state of Maryland. Maryland has a responsibility to monitor the impacts of pesticides on public health and specifically to growing children. Our children deserve their protection. Therefore, Free State PTA and MCC PTA recommends a favorable report on HB 387. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, let's next turn to Jesse Iliff with the Arundel River Waterkeepers. Jesse, welcome. Hi. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jesse Iliff. I'm here on behalf of Waterkeepers Chesapeake, where I serve as board chair. And we are in favor of HB 387 because the regulation of pesticides would be most appropriately lodged with the department that looks out in a holistic manner for the environment uh, in the state. There are currently 82% of the state's rivers and waterways impaired by chemical contaminants, 82%. Maryland Department of Environment already is regulating hazardous waste, toxic air pollutants. They review permit applications for toxic materials and they monitor water pollution uh, of, of, with toxic chemicals. And for those reasons, we feel that it would be able to take the best approach with uh, respect to regulating pesticides. An important point that I wanna bring up to build on the testimony of the prior advocates is that in 2014, the General Assembly provided dedicated funding to the Department of Agriculture to figure out how much pesticide is being used in the state. And this is important because of the synergistic effects of pesticides when they combine in an unregulated way in the environment. Unfortunately, despite that dedicated funding, the Department of Agriculture was only able to secure participation from 7% of farmers and 15% of certified pesticide applicators. So a seven to 15% confidence interval is not a very statistically reliable study, but if you were to take the application rates reported by the farmers in that study, we're talking about upwards of 70 million pounds of pesticides uh, ap applied in the state per year. And the synergistic effects of those pesticides in the environment is very poorly understood. We think that MDE would do a better job of getting a handle on the impacts on the environment of these combined chemicals. And for that reason, we urge a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to now turn to the opponents of the bill, uh, starting with Lindsay Thompson with the grain producers. Lindsay, welcome to the committee and you have two minutes. 
Lindsay Thompson on behalf of the Maryland Grain Producers here today in opposition to House Bill 387. I want to clarify that just because the state of Maryland does not independently evaluate all aspects of pesticides that have been discussed here today, EPA absolutely does. EPA reviews all available studies and data to develop risk assessments that evaluate the potential for harm to humans, fish, plants, wildlife, and risk of surface water contamination. All pesticides must be re-reviewed at least every 15 years, and EPA can and does initiate special reviews if and when new sound scientific information becomes available. Risk-benefit analysis is also a large part of EPA's registration process, and they have initiated special reviews on pollinators, human health issues, and water issues just in the last several years. Maryland already has the authority to make label changes to registration specific to our state, but the language in the bill and the testimony that we've heard here today makes it clear that this is not the intent of the bill, but rather, I quote, to have a process to ban and make restricted use pesticides at the state level. I agree, we should not be playing le legislative whack-a-mole and we should leave pesticide regulation to the agencies with the experts. And I'd argue that at this point, MDE does not have the experts or the resources to implement the intent of this bill either. California's department has been referenced several times by proponents and for informational purposes, their pesticide regulation division alone has a budget of over a hundred million dollars per year. I would also like to point out that farmers honestly have the greatest interest in ensuring that pesticide enforcement is functioning correctly to protect our own families, our farms, the environment, the pollinators that we rely on, and our financial investment in the crop that can be damaged by misapplication. This bill not only transfers pesticide regulation, but a myriad of other inherently agricultural programs such as weed and plant management that we as farmers rely on MDA's experience and expertise for information. With that, I would urge an unfavorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Next, let's go to Colby Ferguson with the Farm Bureau. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Colby Ferguson uh, on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau. And uh, we oppose uh, House Bill 387. Um, we just see that there's quite a few unattended consequences that would come from this. Um, just moving these departments, um, they don't, they're not just like in little silos. The, uh, just in one case, the state chemist would be one that I would bring up. Uh, the state chemist is the one that uh, is in charge of reviewing these pesticides and making the decision on whether to, uh, to approve them in the state of Maryland or not. Um, also, his, his office is in charge of approving feed ingredients and things of that such that would be used for making livestock feeds. Uh, just uh, this bill would gut his um, his department by 54 uh, percent to, to move this over to MDE. Uh, I know this is just a transfer, but also would say that this is a transfer of the people that work at MDA would be transferred over to MDE. So it'd still be the same people. It's not like we're going to move this over and give it to another set of epidemiologists or, or experts. So I don't really see how this would actually fix anything. Um, I don't see how this would cause us to ban more pesticides in the state of Maryland, but I do see how this would be detrimental to the farmers in Maryland to continue to protect their farms, to protect their crops, and to protect the people around them. So with that, we respectfully oppose uh, House Bill 387. Okay, um, we also have three individuals who are signed up uh, informationally. Cassie, you're uh, the MDA rep, and you brought Rob Ho Hofstetter and Kim Rice with you. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to say, or do you just want to uh, answer questions, or do you have a presentation that you have? No, we are simply here just to answer any questions that the committee might have. Okay. All right. Well, we have lots of questions, apparently, and so the first will go to Delegate uh, Linda Foley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so my question um, is we just heard um, from uh, the Farm Bureau about um, how this would, or how they say this will affect farmers. Um, just for, um, for the bill sponsor or for the proponents, um, will this actually make it harder for farmers to be able to um, use the pesticides that they need? Uh, 
Thank, thank you so much for that question. And, and our intent is not to ban all pesticides. There's, I mean, there, there are uses that, that, you know, that pesticides are needed for. We just want to make sure that they're looked at from a holistic point of view. Um, and the, the um, Maryland Department of Agriculture is definitely a part of this, that, that the bill requires that the Maryland Department of Agriculture consult with, I mean, Maryland Department of Environment consult with agriculture and the Department of Health on their particular expertise. But, um, you know, the, the pesticides have an impact far beyond agriculture, which is why they really need to be looked at by the agency that's in charge of um, protecting the health of our waters, our air, um, and, and human health um, a, as well. And, and so, it, you know, we, we expect that Maryland Department of the Environment would, according to the bill, work with agriculture to make sure that they, they do have access to pesticides that they need that, that don't have, you know, egregious impact on, on the environment or on health. Thank you. And just a one uh, follow-up question. Um, does the Department of the Environment have the capacity to do this? I mean, is that maybe somebody from the department can respond to that? I don't. Oh, I don't know if anybody's on the call, but maybe either you or someone. Yeah. So, so let me let me just address that. Um, so, so the um, you know the the question is whether they have the capacity. And so, first of all, as has been noted, the bill not only moves the authority, but it moves all the resources and the the staff that are required. Um, you know, for, for that from Department of Agriculture to Department of our Environment, including funding. So they will be gaining capacity to do that. Um, and, and I also know that there's been some concerns about whether, some concerns that have been expressed to me about whether environment has that capability given limitations that they've had in other areas. Um, and, you know, I, I know that the, the Department of the Environment is not the only agency that's, that's currently underfunded and understaffed. And we do have a new governor coming in next year, hopefully one that, that will um, you know, provide the, the staff and the funding needed. But under any governor, any particular agency can be underfunded and understaffed. So there, there's no guarantee that any agency would have that capability. But we do anticipate that the Department of Environment with the resources moved over will have that capability. Um, Eric, did you wanna add anything on that? Is Eric still here? Um, I, I, guess. I guess not. Um, Hi, no, I'm here. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. No, uh, De Delegate, you said it absolutely perfectly. It, there is that concern about MDE right now, and we would just say that, again, that historically, MDE has been a very strong department, very strong regulator, and we hope that under the next administration that they won't be drastically underfunded, that they will be staffed up, and that they will be the really great agency that they have been in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Kim Rice or Rob Hofstetter have anything to say about this. Well, I guess not. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right, let's go to Delegate Weivel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just looking at the letters from Department of Environment and Department of Ag. So MDE says that it would be a new area of regulatory responsibility outside of the department's expertise, uh, that it transfers all employees within MDA primarily assigned to regulation, and that some of its employees may have responsibilities in other areas that aren't primary responsibility um, that would potentially lead to a lack of necessary personnel at MDE, and then Maryland Department of Ag says that it uh, could result in a massive loss of special and federal funding that MDA relies on for several programs, have numerous unintended consequences, and that MDA staff represents decades of experience, specialized industry training, advanced education, including masters and doctorates, and this bill implies that these dedicated state employees are somehow compromised or unable to fill their professional and public duties. So I guess I'm going back to thinking if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I really don't know what I've heard that you think MDE is better qualified, but I mean, the field of expertise, if you're regulating agriculture, it seems like it's better regulated under the Department of Agriculture. So could you could you try to explain to me what you really hope to gain by transferring this responsibility 
And a lot of the testimony from the proponents was more about banning the use of pesticides and the dangers of pesticides versus moving responsibility from one department to the other. So ultimately, is your goal to ban the use of pesticides that's used by the agricultural community? Wow, Delegate, that's a lot of questions and I will do my best to, to get through them. Um, so uh, starting with, with what the goal is, the goal is not to ban all pesticides. The goal is that all pesticides should be looked at and, and in an appropriate way to, to ensure that we're you know, regulating the ones that need to be regulated to protect the environment and, and human health. And M MDA, um, their, their focus is agriculture, but pesticides are not just used in agriculture. They're used in many, many areas, as has been noted as um, disinfectants in, in schools. And so we, we need to make sure, just, just like with medicines, that we're looking at the risks and the benefits and making sure that the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, and, and that's really important. And we, we do think that MDE is the best agency to do that because they, first of all, already have um, jurisdiction over hazardous substances. Um, and they have the holistic jurisdiction over the, the air, the water, the land, and, and human health. Whereas agriculture is limited to, I mean, their view is agriculture, which is an important part of this. And that's why we've made sure that the Department of Agriculture is, is, part, of the, uh, is part of the equation. But um, you know, they're, they're looking at it from one point of view, whereas MDE has the capability to look at it across health, across the, the waters and the airs and environment and, and you know, working with agriculture and health on this as well. Um, and um, uh, finally, in terms of the MDA employees, as you know, they, they have expertise. They have a lot of expertise and um, you know, we certainly value them for that. And that expertise is going to be moved over to, to MDE under this bill. So we will retain their expertise, but MDE will also have the capability to expand on that with other experts if needed um, to, to do additional um, you know, requirements. Um, and, and if there are concerns about part of some part of this employee's job is one thing, part is another thing. Those are certainly things we, we would be happy to work with Department of Agriculture and Department of Environment on, you know, fixing whatever needs to be fixed in the bill. I also just really, you, you mentioned the letter and, and I'm sorry, you had a lot of questions. So I'm trying to really get through all of them. Um, that the letter from Department of Agriculture where they they said that, um, that, uh, that this bill didn't, I don't remember the exact wording, but didn't, respect the expertise um, of the, the employees in the Department of Agriculture. And that's absolutely not true. We, you know, we do respect their expertise and that's why, and we value their expertise and their years of training. And that's why they, they are being moved over to Maryland Department of the Environment where they can continue to, to use that expertise. Did I hit all your questions? Uh, you did. I guess there's just differences of opinion. And I guess when you have two regulatory agencies, neither of which wants to see the uh, the change. I guess I'm just questioning why we would even entertain the thought. So I thank you for your response. Thank you. Okay, the next question goes to the vice chair of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got a couple questions uh, for the proponents. Uh, first, in terms of your sort of your your key rationale as to why you believe that MDE would be the better regulator when it comes to pesticides, as well as, I guess, plant, plant disease control, mosquito control. Um, it sounds like it's, it's not because MBE has more authority or more resources, but just you feel they would have a different approach. Is that, is that a fair characterization? Absolutely, that, that, that is a fair characterization. Eric, did you wanna? I just wanted to add in the states like New York and New Jersey, where they have their departments of environment doing this, they use nuances. They don't have a sledgehammer and, and just ban pesticides one after the other. They make nuanced decisions like don't do this too close to the water, don't do that in a watershed, things like that. And we think that those softer responses are very good ways of looking at this overall. Okay, all right. Um, and my second question it is a follow up to what Delegate Weibel was asking, um, and specifically the agencies uh, discussed what they believe would be transition issues, moving 
responsibility from MDA to MDE, they say would imperil potentially some funding, certification, create inspection delays. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, is there someone that wants to take that one? As, as far as the transferring for, from the agencies, look, this has been done before in the state of Maryland. It's never specifically easy, but we're talking about the same, the same amount of money, the same number of pins, the same amount of employees. I don't think it's that would be that difficult for a good department of budget and management to pull it off. Okay, thank you. Next question goes to Delegate Lehman. Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, if I missed this in your presentation, uh, Delegate Ruth, or if one of your um, uh, supporters um, addressed this, I apologize. I, I'm not sure if you talked about why or how, other than its limited sort of scope and its focus, why or what evidence is there that the Maryland Department of Agriculture is not able to effectively you know, manage or oversee um, uh, pesticide management. What, other than, or, or is the main argument? It's sort of more. It's it's focused on only agriculture. Well, I would say yeah. the fact that we had to come to you to ban chlorpyrifos, and the fact that we had to come to you to regulate the use of neonicotinoids are just two examples of why we think it could be do, done better than it's been done over the last many years. And is that Delegate Ruth? Is that do you agree with that? Yeah, yes. I mean, it's we're, we're not in any way offending Department of Agriculture or saying that they, they are incompetent. What we're saying is they have a very narrow, specific focus, um, which is agriculture, which is an important part of things. But we need a different focus. We need a focus that's going to look at all the aspects of, of pesticides and, you know, really focus on their, their impact on the, the environmental and human health. Um, going back really quickly, um, if I could, Mr. Chair, to the uh, idea of, um, I, you know, I, I didn't realize I didn't look through the whole bill and realize you were calling for the movement of um, certain Department of Agriculture staff over to MDE. It, it, did you give consideration or would there be, um, you know, any scenario under which you could see this being shared, you know, between the two agencies, not, not moving MDA staff over, but delineating you know, between the two agencies, leaving agriculture to agriculture and everything else to environment, or would, would that just make it too confusing? Actually, we did consider that um, having some sort of shared responsibility, and we did decide that would be too confusing um, to, you know, to try to work through, that, that it's better to have one agency have primacy and be required to work with the other agencies. Eric, did you want to add to that? I would just say we are open to other ideas, though. Yeah, absolutely. We've We've presented this, what we think is a problem, and we, we've presented what we think is a solution, but we are open to other people's proposed solutions, without a doubt. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you, Delegate Ruth. Next question goes to Delegate Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, I guess uh, I got a question for Delegate Ruth and perhaps Lindsey Thompson at the same time. Um, you know, Delegate Ruth, you, you've mentioned several times about, about the Department of Ag's uh, oversight is really <clears throat> their only concern really with, with the use for agricultural, uh, the use in agricultural, uh, you know, the, in, in the agriculture community and not as deeply as you'd like to see. Um, both agencies have Point out reasons why they didn't. They don't think it's a good idea to convert over. But I believe it was uh, uh, Lindsey Thompson earlier testified about the EPA is really who regulates pesticides, and that, that all pesticides are regulated through the EPA, no matter what department is 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 implementing what part of it. So that's that's one question. I, I'd like a little more uh, information on on the EPA involvement in, in the use on, on the control or the use of pesticides, because I don't think it's a simple 
Department of Ag or Department of Environment issue. I think it's a it's a much higher arc uh, that's really overseeing the the, the uh, use of pesticides. And the second thing is, I believe currently that Department of Ag regulates the sale, use, distribution, storage of all pesticides, not just ag pesticides. And they uh, regulate all pest, they uh, register all pesticides, not just ag pesticides. So it's much more involved in the Department of Agriculture oversight of pesticides than just for the use of ag pesticides. It's all pesticides. And, and uh, you know, I think it's, it's an unfair statement to say that the only thing they're looking out for is use of pesticides for ag use. So what say you? Oh, th thank you so much for the question, Delegate. And, and actually, I think that that is our point, is that Department of Agriculture has responsibility for pesticides that are, that are not just used in agriculture, um, and that those, those um, pesticides really should be in, re regulated by the agency that, that oversees environmental and human health throughout the state. And, and that because pesticides are not only used in agriculture, that agriculture may really not be the appropriate place for them, even though we know that they currently are. Um, and, and again, in no way is this saying they're doing a bad job, but it's it's just we need a more holistic focus. Um, and, and in terms of the EPA, I'll, uh, briefly, I'll just say if, if the EPA we're, we're regulating pesticides the way they should, then we shouldn't have to have had these bills in, in our committee in this legislature to regulate specific pesticides. And so we, as a state, have a right to regulate pesticides to protect our state. Um, and we need a systematic approach to do that. But in terms of the specific EPA process, I wonder if one of the experts could speak on that. Delegate Jacobs, I believe that you directed part of your question at me. Well, you brought up, Lindsay, you brought up part of the EPA oversight earlier in your testimony, and I think it's a real important key to this, this whole piece of legislation is, you know, everybody's trying to move this oversight from one department to another when neither department thinks it should happen. And I think that, that EPA plays a big role in this, and I'd just like to understand at what level they are because, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, ag does more than just uh, can, uh, regulate pesticides just for ag use, they, that, that all pesticides are regulated and registered there, whatnot. So I'm just trying to understand the, the whole picture. A Lindsay, bit. Lindsay, what do you have to say about all that? Sure. So I think um, part of the reason that we are concerned about the bill as drafted transferring several different authorities, not just pesticide regulatory authority, including the plant and weed management um, division specifically, and some other provisions of the state chemist's office, things having to do with nursery inspection and uh, the quarantine program, as an example, causing disruptions there. And, and maybe those are unintended consequences, um, but those uh, are definitely of concern to the agricultural community with that transfer. Um, I did wanna point out that I think that there's some confusion about the mission of the Department of Agriculture um, so their official mission is to, yes, provide leadership and support to agriculture and the citizens of Maryland through conducting regulatory uh, service and educational activities to assure consumer confidence, protect the environment, and promote agriculture. Um, and so I did just want to point that out. Um, but as far as EPA goes, I don't think that we have enough time to kind of argue the efficacy of the EPA regulatory process, although I would say that it is a, a robust process. The, the thing that I wonder about, frankly, is whether or not with existing resources um, and just transferring the authority from MDA to MDE, whether or not there is a robust and meaningful process to make these additional limitations um, to conduct actual scientific evaluation and analyses 
similar to what we've heard in other states like California, which I mentioned has an over $100 million budget per year just for their pesticide division. Um, and so I'm just not sure exactly what uh, meaningful scientifically grounded changes um, above and beyond what the EPA is already doing could be achieved with existing resources. Um, happy to discuss the full EPA regulatory process offline, but I don't want to take up your time with that now. Mr. Chairman. That's, and that's fine, Mr. Chairman. That, that's all I have for that. Thank you. Yes, I, Delegate Ruth, uh, yeah, do you have something yeah. you want to say? Yes, thank you so much. Um, so first of all, I wanted to, to mention relating to California that we we are not saying that Maryland's process should, should mirror California's. We did look at California's process and they have an incredibly robust process that, um, you know, we, while it would be great if we had that, we recognize the, the cost of that would be more than, than Maryland could, could bear. And that's why we specifically are not looking at California as a model. They have a whole separate division that all they, they do is pesticide regulation. However, um, you know, we as a state, and um, Lindsay said, what else could we be doing? We as a state can look at what other states are doing, like California and New York as well. If California has done research or, or you know, done work on particular pesticides, then, then our um, Department of Environment or whoever is regulating it can look at that work and then determine if that's applicable to Maryland and if that's something that, that we should be considering. We don't have to do all our own original research on that. Um, and then in terms of the, the, diff, the fact that, um, as Lindsay mentioned, both, both agencies say they don't want this. And I know change is hard. Um, and, you know, people, I, I studied systems analysis in college. And, and, you know, one of the things that we learned was that people are resistant to change. I, and, and I understand people don't want change, but, if moving this is not the answer, we're, we're happy to work with the agencies to find out what the answer is because we clearly need something more than, than what we have now. And um, that I think was the question about the EPA process ever answered, did we need? Well, well you know, um, uh, why don't we go to uh, Delegate Boyce and then Delegate Terraza and then uh, let's, let's proceed that way. Delegate Boyce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think um, for me, the elephant in the room is the agencies. Um, and I want to piggyback off of Delegate Weibel, Delegate Layman's question. Um, if, if both of them are saying that they, 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 one is going to be harmed by this and one doesn't want this, it, it gives me grave concern about giving something to somebody that they don't essentially want. Um, and so I, I want to form it, put in a formal question, but is it, Fair to say, Delegate Ruth, that um, as we work this out and potentially a subcommittee, would you be open to, instead of creating this move, creating more of a powerhouse between the three agencies to make this decision rather than taking something one from another? That's my first question. And then my second question is, I, I would like if the agencies are here to speak to this because uh, I need more than uh, the letter for us to, to speak about what um, issues are there with uh, the Department of Ag? We, we've read the letter, but I'd like to be yeah, able to- we, Well, yeah, this might be a good time for, I, I don't wanna, if, if a lot of the people wanna respond, they should, but this might be a good time for the Department of Ag reps to respond to your question. That's, you know. I, yeah, I, I, I agree. Could, could I just address the first part of the question, Mr. Sure. Chair? Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we we actually did look at a situation exactly like what you're describing, where the three agencies would would be charged with working together. That was one of the first solutions that that we considered, and we are certainly open to to whatever solution the agencies think is going to work best. We thought that having three agencies being required to work together would cause you know confusion um, between them but if if that's what the agencies think is best and that's what this committee thinks is best we're certainly open to that it's something i'm open to only because what i'm hearing is that each one of them have an expertise that lends itself to the process in a whole and putting it in then one other person's hands i think leaves out again the other right and if we're saying we want a holistic view 
on pesticides, we're still leaving out another group of individuals. So I'm, I'm hoping we can discuss that a little further, but I would like to hear from um, the Department of Ag and the Department of Environment if they're on, um, Mr. Chairman, if, if it's allowable to- I don't uh, see anybody from uh, the Department of the Environment, but there are two people from Ag at least. Yeah, I would like to hear more about the issues caused by a really you're taking resources from a person, a place that's resourced and putting it into another place that unfortunately, historically now has been under resourced. Chairman Barbe, uh, I'm Kim Rice and I'm with the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Uh, I'm the program manager for plant protection and weed management. So in this uh, proposed bill, part of the laws that we regulate, uh, including nursery inspection um, and invasive pest quarantines have been listed. So essentially this law would split the program that I manage in half. Um, part of our staff would go to MDE, um, the nursery inspection staff, um, and the quarantine staff. So for example, I spoke to this committee about spotted lanternfly, that program essentially would be moved to MDE. And we would still have half the staff here. And there are other laws that we regulate that we use present staff that would be moved. So we would need additional staff to regulate some of those laws because they would have been moved to MDE. So that's only specific to my program and I can only speak to that, but that is part of what um, we would be dealing with here at MDA. So, and, and just a follow-up question and then I'm sure. done, Mr. Chair. So what I'm hearing you saying is that you would be, your program will be cut in half for which you would still have to get more staff to do the rest of your job. So this really puts a, a, a personnel uh, issue on, on both sides, I would say. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, next question goes to Delegate Terraza. Jen? Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just going back for a second, I, I, um, Delegate Ruth, there was some conversation about IPM in schools. What, what, um, what evidence do you have that MDA is not enforcing the IPM in schools law? Just wanted to go back to that for a second. Yeah, um, who's the best person to address that? Well, I, I could say a little bit about it, but we have a whole fact sheet on that. And what I'd rather do, Delegate, is to provide you with that whole fact sheet about it because it outlines, it chronicles what's happened over the years. And, it, and my understanding is that there are still school districts that are legally required to have plans that don't even have the plans on, on paper. But we have people who are better better off talking about that that aren't on the call here. And I'd love to pre present you with that written material. Okay, I mean, I guess you should probably share it with the committee and then- Yeah, we'll yeah. share it with the committee. Okay. But my understanding is that there are whole districts that are legally required to have plans on paper that don't have plans on paper for several, for many years. Hmm, okay. And it's been brought up to them and then nothing's been done. Okay, all right, thank you. Do you want me to give a specific example? From yeah, I, I don't, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sure. Um, so um, again, I'm very familiar with Montgomery County specifically, um, and uh, we have a regulation, but we can't find the policy that goes with the regulation. So we've looked and looked for the policy and we've never gotten the policy, even though we do have a regulation. Um, and so that's for the more um, typical uh, pest management. Um, when it came to um, COVID times, um, all, this, uh, all these disinfectants were brought into the classroom used around children. Specifically, one was a spick and span product that was bought in bulk and it had quats and fragrance and Believe it or not, those are actually registered pesticides. This is what I learned, um, the disinfectants registered pesticides, but we couldn't really find um, either in the green cleaning plan or in the pesticide regulation where it protected children because there's safer disinfectants that are known and you can look at the EPA site to find those safer um, ingredients. And so we had to um, fight to get the um, more harsh chemicals away from children and at least not be used in 
between, you know, while they're at their desks spraying their <laughs> desks with this stuff. Um, so yeah, it took us a while, but we got it done. But it would be great if we actually had um, stronger uh, policy that could go along with the regulations. Chairman Barbie, may I speak up, please? Certainly. Who? Uh, uh, my, uh, my name is Rob Hofstetter. I'm the uh, program manager for the pesticide regulations section. Um, every sure. single school district in the state of Maryland has a plan on file that has been shared with multiple media outlets as well as CPAC. So they are on file. Uh, there is no what, what, was that, what was that last? What was that last acronym? CPAC, the Children's Environmental Protection. I'm sorry, um, Children's Environment. I'm at a loss. I'm sorry. That's, fine. <laughs> that's, that's, that's close enough. We can look it up. Um, but but every school system has a plan on file with the department and they always have um, inspections are done yearly. Um, and so it's it's not there. There 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 are plans on file. Uh, there's been a lot of mention about disinfectants in schools and um the way the regulations are written, uh, currently uh, antimicrobials are exempt from the uh, from the IPM and schools regulations. So how uh, how or how not are antimicrobials regulated? Well, they, they are a pesticide, but they have been exempt from the IPM and school regulations, which which is. Um, um, uh, I honestly can't speak to why we did that as I wasn't part of that when it was written, okay. um, but it is consistent with a lot of the EPA documentation and with a lot of the other IPM and schools across the country. Um, it, it, it has to do with use um, with, with the janitors being able to, to have access to it as well as the school nurses um, without having to be certified or registered or, or trained on a yearly basis as, as the turnover, I think is quite high with those folks. But, um, I mean, it is in, it, it, it is part of the regulation right now that they are, um, they are exempted. Um, but I, I, I will assure the committee that every single school system has a plan on file and they have since the uh, beginning. Okay. Very useful. Um, any other questions? Um, so Eric, I, I've got a question. Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, so basically we're talking about moving people and budgetary money from one person who's been appointed by a governor to another person who's been appointed by the same governor. So seems to me the most important thing is who the governor is, not where the agency is parked. I would say that that may be true right now, but there, but one thing to note is that MDE is having difficult times right now, but we would say that those difficult times are really based in this administration and how they've been funded at this time. We would argue that MDA has had some of these issues for longer uh, than just one administration. It goes on for quite a while. Uh, so that we, you know, from our perspective, that although a, a governor would be very important, we think there is a mindset that is different in the states that have their in Department of the Environment in charge. They do nuances, they do things with wetlands and waterways and things like that that don't happen in states where they have their Department of Agriculture being the sole resource. You know, uh, there's in um, Eric in, um, you know, in chemistry, uh, in medicine rather, there's a saying that the poison is in the concentration. So believe it or not, I, I watched this stupid guy on YouTube uh, dilute cyanide down to the point where he could still drink it and not die instantly. And this is not something I would recommend for any sane individual, but he was attempting to prove the point that at very low doses, even, even something as deadly as cyanide can be tolerated. So who is it in the government right now who decides what a dangerous concentration level of benzene is, say, in, in the water or or no, benzene's a bad example because that's an industrial chemical. Um, 
you know, who 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 is it right now, absent this law, who investigates what 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 is a dangerous dosage of a substance in, you know, in the water? Because I mean, uh, truthfully speaking, you, if you dilute something down enough, if if there's one thing I've learned in my business, uh, which is hazardous waste disposal, if you dilute something down enough, it really isn't going to hurt anything. And I'm not saying that as a way to excuse industry or anybody. But I mean, who who right now in government makes that decision or does nobody do that? Well, I believe that MDE does the most regulation of toxics and, uh-huh. and, those, and, and the water. I don't, I can't speak to your specific example, but okay. we believe that the bulk of that is MDE. Mr. Chair, I think Dr. Ekniaski you wanted to answer also. Sure, oh, yes. well, please go ahead. Um, yes, what I wanted to say in, in response to your comment that the dangers in the dose of the poison. Um, in kids, that's not always true. Uh, some kids cannot tolerate exposures to even the most minimal dose. Lead's a good example of that. There's no safe level of lead. And mm-hmm. industry fought for years and years and decades and decades against banning lead in their paints. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a result, generations of children were affected by uh, damage brought by those lead paints. Um, the example of chlorpyrifos, which this committee heard for the last several years, the EPA scientists found that there was no safe level of chlorpyrifos to which a child could be exposed. Uh, and it's an example of where the EPA's regulatory process broke down under the last administration. Rather than ban chlorpyrifos as they should have, they elected to defer deciding on that uh, from the administrator at the time. And as a result, you know, for the following four years, we were debating chlorpyrifos as to whether it should be used or not. So there's, there's definitely a lack of um, public health evaluation going into approval of pesticides and a willingness to accept evidence that a chemical that was previously thought to be safe is now harmful. Uh, So I think that that kind of thing is what's lacking uh, from the Department of Agriculture's point of view. Um, You know, they they weren't bringing forth a lot of public health representatives during the chlorpyrifos debate to defend the safety of the product. Uh, So I think that when science shows that a substance is not safe at any level, that that needs to be considered very, very strongly in deciding whether it should be allowed to be used or not, and whether agriculture or environment is the appropriate channel to make that decision. I think it's something that needs to be done jointly by all, that the environmental impacts of a pesticide need to be considered. Stuff gets run off into water supplies. It drifts by air far beyond where it's applied. Um, I think for those reasons, you know, it's not purely an agricultural issue. Um, you know, whether any of those departments is adequately staffed to enforce these regulations is, is something that the government has to decide is a worthwhile investment at all levels from the government all the way on down to the local, local governments. So, okay. Oh, go ahead. I thought you were. I just wanted to say that, that you know, that the um, idea that, that there's a safe level of a particular poison is not necessarily a true statement. Okay, fair enough. Lindsay, you, uh, would you like to say something? I was just gonna say to, to simply answer your question there at the end as to who has the authority and responsibility for setting levels of concern and water contamination standard levels, um, mm-hmm. that is the US EPA for regulated substances. And then the enforcement for that is delegated to the agency of authority within each state, depending on what that substance is. Okay. Well, um, we've had a lot of really good discussion on this. Uh, Oh, Delegate Foley, do you have a question? I'm sorry, Uh, uh, Ms. Thompson's answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Ms. Thompson's answer raised another question for me. So you said it's, it's EPA, right? Not agriculture. 
that regulates those at the federal government, right? So pesticide regulation at the federal government level is done by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and they delegate authority within each of the states for pesticide regulation at the state level. And currently there are five or six states that is not within the Department of Agriculture and the remainder are currently within the Department of Ag. Okay, thank you. Um, Adam, uh, do you wanna say something here? Yeah, um, I covered this in uh, to, like our written testimony um, from the law clinic. Uh, just to address that, that's not true. Um, there are more than five uh, departments throughout states that regulate pesticides that are not the Department of Agriculture. Um, DC is, is one that's also not a state that wasn't mentioned in our report, but um, Alaska, Rhode Island, New York, New Jersey, um, we're all South Carolina, we're all listed in our report, Connecticut, um, which California was one that we were talking about, but that was a pesticide Department of Pesticide Regulation, uh, which was something different. Um, and then talking- So six. I, I, um, possibly more. They, these are the ones that we covered specifically in our report. Um, this would be at least seven plus DC um, that we know of, which was in our, our written testimony. And could I clarify a, a point about um, FIFRA and regulation of pesticides that was discussed tell us, earlier? Tell us what FIFRA is first. Yeah, so it is the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. Uh, it's the federal statute that governs the re uh, registration, distribution, sale, and use of pesticides in the U.S. Um, so under FIFRA, which is the federal pesticide law, it in Section 24A, it addresses the authority of states, uh, which was just discussed earlier. A state may regulate the sale or use of any registered pesticide within their state. Um, so all, all pesticides are registered at the EPA level, but states also have to register and license pesticides for use in the U.S., uh, or sorry, for use in their specific state. Okay, uh, we're going to leave this public hearing right now. I think there's been a lot of good conversation on this. I think everybody's asked a question who wishes to, and I believe both sides have been able to weigh in in a manner that I consider to be adequate. So that ends the public hearing on this bill. It ends the public hearing for this afternoon, I believe. Hold on, let me double check. Um, yeah, that ends the public hearing for this afternoon. Announcements. We're By the way, before uh, subcommittee chairs make announcements, we're going to have a leadership meeting after the last subcommittee has met. So announcements, subcommittee chairs. Mr. Chair. Marvin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Housing and Real Property Subcommittee Meet, uh, we'll meet at uh, 4.45, and <clears throat> I'm hopeful, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, we can go through uh, three or four bills uh, in relative quick fashion. Okay, uh, okay. 4.45, HR. Thank okay, you. Dana. Yes, Environment Subcommittee will meet at 4.45. Hopefully, we can be done by 5.15. Okay, anybody else? All righty then, our leadership group will be around 520 then. So uh, anybody else have an announcement for the good of the order? Okay, seeing none. In that case, good public hearing. And